I recently moved into this quaint suburban neighborhood and ever since, I've had a sense of unease. The residents here were friendly enough, always waving and offering warm smiles as I walked by, but there was something about their gazes that left me feeling on edge. One evening, as I returned home from work, I noticed a flyer in my mailbox, an invitation to join the neighborhood watch, a group of residents dedicated to keeping the community safe. I kind of laughed to myself, as I always thought that was sort of a thing of the past, but I considered attending a meeting, but my schedule was already packed and I had little time for social engagements at the time. As the weeks went by, I couldn't help but notice the watch members becoming increasingly more visible. They patrolled the streets at all hours, they even had walkie-talkies, and they were crackling with static as they exchanged updates and reports. It was pretty corny. But I appreciated their dedication to our safety, but I couldn't shake the feeling that they were watching me just a little too closely. It's worth noting that these stares and unwanted attention was nothing new for me. I have a neon green mohawk and a tattoo of a moth on my neck. One night, after returning from a late shift at the office, I found my front door wide open. Panic surged through me as I started to rush inside, fearing for the worst of being robbed. To my relief, nothing appeared to be missing or damaged, and I just chalked it up to my own carelessness and resolved to being more vigilant in the future. After all, it was pretty windy, and I suppose it is possible that I could have left the door slightly open. However, the incidents didn't stop there. Over the next few weeks, I found my trash cans overturned, my garden sort of trampled, and my car vandalized. I reported these events to the police, but they were never any leads or suspects. As the harassment escalated, so too did my suspicion of that neighborhood watch and the weirdos that were a part of it. Through all of these incidents, the neighborhood watch was always outside and around, and whenever I questioned them if they had seen anything, they mostly just shrugged and seemed kind of unresponsive. I began to wonder if they were behind these incidents and targeting me for reasons that I couldn't possibly fathom. The fear and paranoia that gripped me were palpable, leaving me constantly on edge, and I was determined to find answers, so I decided to attend the next neighborhood watch meeting. As I entered the community center, I felt the weight of just all the eyes that were clearly on me. The room was quiet as the members kind of exchanged these uneasy glances, but I thought maybe I was just reading too much into their body language. The meeting began with the usual updates and reports, but I couldn't help but notice the tension that was in the air. When it came time for new business, I mustered my courage and confronted the group about the harassment I'd been experiencing. I even went as far as to accuse the watch of having some sort of vendetta against me. I was met with a mixture of shock and sympathy and denial. Several members insisted that the watch had nothing to do with the incidents, while others suggested that perhaps I had made some enemies in the neighborhood and maybe those people were the ones causing me those issues. Now as the meeting ended, I felt a weird mixture of frustration and kind of hopelessness. It seemed that no one was willing to admit any wrongdoing or help me find the truth. I decided that if I wanted answers, I would have to find them on my own. Over the next few weeks, I conducted my own covert surveillance, so to speak, discreetly documenting the movements and actions of the watch members. One night, I ended up having to work late. When I pulled into my driveway, I noticed that the floodlight positioned right above my side door was on. Now feeling that hunch, I decided to leave my car parked in the road and quietly made my way to the side door. Now when I made it inside, I found two of my neighbors who looked like they were trying to find something in my kitchen. I pulled out my cell phone and started recording a video, and I couldn't believe what I captured. My neighbors appeared to be planning something in my kitchen drawers. Thankfully in the video, you can clearly see and hear them discussing calling the cops. I remained hidden and allowed the two to leave my house. As I pieced together this weird puzzle, a chilling theory sort of emerged in my head. These neighborhood watch members believed that my unconventional appearance made me a threat to the community's image, and they had to take it upon themselves to get rid of me. Now, with the evidence that I now had with the phone video, I just confronted the police with it. Surprisingly, they were appalled by my findings and decided to take immediate action. The guilty members were not only removed from the neighborhood watch, but 
Thankfully, they were also arrested on several different charges. Now, with the truth out there, the neighborhood watch in my little town was completely disbanded. Not knowing if anyone else was involved with these two, I found it increasingly difficult to trust anyone within my now community. However, not long after this, the harassment completely stopped, and my life felt like it finally returned to normal. I had managed to expose all of this on my own, and the ordeal had made me stronger, I guess. In the end, my actions sparked a conversation within the neighborhood about tolerance and acceptance. People began opening up to one another, sharing their own experiences and perspectives, and as a result, our community became more inclusive and understanding. As for me, I decided to remain in the neighborhood, determined to be a force for positive change, even though I was kind of lazy and didn't want to leave. I even went as far as forming my own neighborhood watch, using my newfound sense of empowerment to help protect and actually uplift my fellow neighbors and community. Now, although the scars of those weeks would always still be there, they also served as a reminder of the strength and courage that can be found within each of us, even in the face of all the adversity that you might see. Now, my experience taught me that standing up for oneself and seeking the truth, no matter how difficult, weird, and sometimes scary the journey may be, can make a lasting impact on you and those around you. Back in 2019, I moved from the West Coast to a small town in upstate New York. The town had that charming feel that you would find almost in a Hallmark movie. Everyone seemed to be friendly and helpful, and I felt welcomed into the community soon after moving in. Now, a few months later, one of my neighbors went door to door informing everyone that there had been a theft from their shed, which was in their backyard. The supposed thief had stolen a weed whacker, lawnmower, and other outdoor tools. Although the news of the theft had left some of the neighborhood shocked and kind of scared, I didn't feel uncomfortable or really paranoid. Having lived in a rough neighborhood before, I was kind of desensitized to theft. However, I reassured my neighbors in a concerned voice that I would keep my eyes peeled for any sort of behavior like that. A couple of weeks went by without any further news of any sort of theft in the neighborhood until one afternoon when I got home from work. I found a flyer in my mailbox with the heading, Neighborhood Watch. The flyer wasn't really official, there's no official watch team, but rather a group of neighbors who wanted to get together to stop ongoing thefts. Confused as I had not heard or been notified of any other crimes in the area, I went next door and asked my neighbor Cliff if he had heard anything. Cliff was one of those kind of stoic types. He was in his early 70s and a widower. His wife, Irene, had passed away a few years before I moved into town. Even though Cliff was quiet, he was one of the nicest people I had met since moving there. He had helped me fix my car dishwasher, dryer, and even installed a new sliding door for me after a storm knocked a tree through the previous one. I never asked him to do any of these things, but he always insisted, saying that it gave him a chance to get out of the house and be productive. I liked his calm and quiet demeanor as it reminded me of my dad. When I asked Cliff if he had heard anything about the ongoing crime, he kind of grumbled in his gruff voice, saying, I don't really know too much. I guess some punks have been breaking into sheds and stealing stuff. Nothing of mine has been stolen. I nodded and made some small talk with him before I started to walk down his driveway. When I was a few feet away, he shouted to me, Hey, just be careful and make sure you lock your doors. I did hear that whoever's doing that is breaking into houses now, so... I smiled and thanked him for one last time. That night was no different from any other night. I made my dinner, had a few glasses of wine, and did some work on my computer. At around 11 that evening, I thought that I had heard something outside, like a cough or something. I made my way to the big window in my living room and looked through the blinds. Across the street, I saw one of my neighbors outside looking right at my house. It was strange and a little creepy, but I thought that he could have been just looking at the stars, so I just sort of dismissed it. A few minutes later, I couldn't shake that weird and horrible feeling in my stomach. I decided to get up and grab another glass of wine. My kitchen is in the back of the house, and I have one of those big bay windows over the sink and counter that overlooks the backyard. 
I have a big yard that empties into a small wooded area. When I was pouring another glass, I happened to look out the window and I thought that I saw some movement. I shut the lights off in the kitchen so I wasn't visible from the outside. I cut my hands and looked through the glass of the window. To my disbelief, there was a person in my backyard looking at my house. I couldn't tell who it was as it was too dark and they were far enough away but it was undeniably a person. While I stood there in a sort of panic, the silhouette of the person started to jog towards my house. I jumped back, trying to process my thoughts. I decided to call the police but my phone was in the other room. As I composed myself and started briskly walking toward the other room, I heard a loud bang upstairs. I froze again. In those brief seconds of panic, I heard heavy footsteps upstairs. I ran to the closet in the living room and hid underneath all the blankets. My phone was still on the other table and I didn't know what to do. At this point, I had no idea how many people were in my house and what kind of danger I truly was in. Within seconds of hiding, I could hear the heavy boots making their way down my hardwood steps. In a sheer stroke of luck, there was a knock on the door and the footsteps stopped abruptly. The boots sounded like they were right outside my door. Another knock on the door and this time was followed by the line, Hello? Is anyone home? This is the police. I heard the steps move a bit faster and stop in another room. By the sound, I could tell that the intruder was no longer near the closet door. With only one hope, I ran out of the closet into my front door. I opened it up and thankfully, it actually was a real police officer. I started to frantically plead that someone was in my house and I heard the steps go in that direction. The two officers began to run inside and in no time at all, they were escorting a man out of my house in cuffs. I felt sick as I stood and stared at the officers arresting the man, not because I had an intruder in my house, but because that intruder was Cliff, Cliff from next door. I was speechless as he walked by, mumbling some sort of nonsense to himself. While I was outside talking to the cops, I noticed the neighbor across the street whom I saw staring at my home and the other person whom I saw in the backyard come over to me. I immediately went into defense mode thinking that these two were part of the intrusion but I couldn't have been more wrong. These two were on a late night walk and had seen Cliff going into my window upstairs. They called the police and were watching Cliff's movements upstairs. I guess they didn't want to bring attention to the situation in case I was in immediate danger. After an investigation they found out that Cliff was the neighbor thief as well. He admitted to stealing all those belongings and breaking into my home. However, he never admitted what he had planned on doing inside my home that evening, which still kind of makes me sick thinking about it. I guess after his wife died and retiring from his job, he was bored and was looking for any form of excitement he could find. He found that rush from stealing and unfortunately that hunger, I guess, just kind of grew. And in hindsight, I'm thankful for our little makeshift neighborhood watch. If it hadn't been for my lovely neighbors, the end of this story could have been much different. My mother was the type of person who really depended on no one. That was until she had to have both of her legs amputated. She lived on social security and she was not a rich woman. When she came home from rehabilitation, my brother and I had to find someone to help her get up and ready in the morning, and also to put her to bed. She was fine during the day with her trusted wheelchair. My brother worked weird hours with the railroad, and I lived far away, so we were of no help. Luckily, she had a neighbor who was a caregiver, and had offered her services for $15 an hour. She did this professionally, and I couldn't believe our good luck. I would call my mother daily to check up on her, and she seemed to be just fine. One morning I had called, and she was crying, and she said that the caregiver's husband had been there that morning and tried to kiss her, and that he made her lie naked for a very long time, and it was cold. I told my mother how could that be true? Who would be trying to kiss an 80-year-old amputee? I also didn't hire an unexperienced man to take care of my mother. 
I called the woman and she said she had an emergency and that she had to have her husband come over and help her. I told the woman what my mom had told me and she and I agreed that maybe my mother had some dementia. She said that her husband would never do that, especially to a woman in her 80s with no legs. My mother then told me that she didn't want them in her house ever again. Then the woman quit on us the next day with no warning. I think she must have known he was a pervert. Maybe she was too. I unfortunately am very ashamed to admit that I didn't do any background checks. The next time I visited, I had went to their house to pay them what we owed them. This was the first time I had met the husband. The husband would not make any eye contact with me. I left with the feeling that my mother was probably right. Well, later in the year, the next time I visited, I heard that he was in jail for molesting his wife's granddaughters who were still in diapers. I will never ever stop feeling guilty for not believing my mother. Who the hell knows what he actually did to her? Did he drug her and molest her too? Did he go through her stuff? Did he try on her clothes? I hope that perverted bastard rots in jail, or the fellow prisoners hear what he did to the little girls and old women and give him a taste of his own medicine. I grew up living in rural Vermont. We had lived on a mountain road and there was a field behind our house that I often played. There were also woods on the far edge of the field and if you went through them, this would take you to another field. The entire thing was fenced in as cows were placed inside each summer. The field was owned by a local farmer. I often played with the cows and I had also followed them through their various paths in the woods. One day when I was around 12 years old, I was playing in the woods as normal and I was riding on the back of one of the cows. She ambled slowly along and I just casually rode along eating some blackberries that I had picked. She headed down a trail in the woods that I knew would bring us out of a clearing that I'd really enjoyed sitting in. When we popped out, I glanced over at the fence as it bordered the property of one of our neighbors. This man had always made me nervous. His hair was tangled into one big mass of a knot, and he smelled horrible. Unfortunately, he was outside in his yard, and he spotted me immediately. Now, he didn't own that field or the cows, so I wasn't too bothered. I just got down off the cow's back and began to poke around in the berry patch. Suddenly, I heard the twang of barbed wire fencing then being strained. I looked back, and the man was climbing over with a rifle. I quickly ran into the woods to hide, thinking he wouldn't follow me, but he did. I could hear the sounds of sticks cracking as he pursued me. I ducked under some branches to catch my breath, and I sat quietly as I could as my ears strained. He was definitely still out there, but I still had a lead on him. I knew that there was a spot a little further up where I could climb under the fence and then come out on the road. I made a break for it and I climbed out of the pasture quickly. Once I was on the road, I stopped to look backwards, assuming I was now safe. The man stepped out of the woods and he stood there pointing his gun right at me. I thought that I was going to die right on the spot. I then slowly walked backwards, watching him the entire time. Right in that moment, a vehicle came around the corner, and when I then turned to look at who it was as they drove by, I turned back to the man, and he was gone. I avoided that pasture for a very long time after that. I'm a 21-year-old male, and my girlfriend is 20. We rented out an apartment for a month. The area was secluded, and after dark, everyone would really just mind their own business. The neighbors would hardly even talk to each other or even be outside in the evening. Our apartment was in a building with four floors and each floor had a single apartment. All of the apartments were very compact and built to be rented to students. The night that we moved in, our taps ran out of water, so I went upstairs hoping to borrow some from the people living upstairs. 
I had realized that two out of the four apartments were vacant, and they were also locked. The apartment on the fourth floor was lit from the inside, so I decided to ring the bell, but to my disappointment, nobody answered. Over the next week, we had gotten used to hearing the sound of someone whacking a rod, or some sort of metal on maybe the floor, or some other object. This would start late at night, after 1.30 a.m., and then continue for hours. Initially, we didn't really care about it, but after some time, it got us intrigued. The sound was clearly from one of the apartments above us, but as I already mentioned, two of the three apartments were vacant for sure, and the third one seemed vacant as well. But as I said, it was lit from the inside. I knocked on its door many times, but no one ever answered. The whacking sound was a daily occurrence, and on some very late nights, we could hear someone climbing the building stairs. It seemed as if we were the only ones living in this building, especially during the day and until the very late nights. We had made up theories just to try and convince ourselves that it was nothing but the pattern of the whacking was way too irregular for it to be made by wind or something other than a person. It would start almost daily at around the same time. We had asked people around, but we didn't get any satisfactory answer. No one knew if anyone lived there. Towards the end of our stay, I saw a shady-looking man going upstairs during the day. I asked him if he was the owner of the apartments upstairs. He said that he was, also including the one on the fourth floor. I asked him if anyone lived upstairs, and also about the strange whacking sound. He told me that no one did, and that he's actually looking for tenants. He also said that he had no idea about the sound. To my surprise, he then asked me, So how long are you going to stay here? Four more days. We're actually leaving on the 30th of this month. I replied, he asked me if anyone else had rented the place for the next month, and I told him that I didn't know. The strangest part is that for the next four days, there was neither the whacking sound, nor the sound of someone climbing up the stairs late at night. However, my girlfriend's internship got extended by two days, and we decided to stay there. And just as I had anticipated, the whacking sound resumed after the 30th, the day we were supposed to leave. I don't know what it was, I don't think I'll ever know, but I'm just happy that we got out of that place without any crazy consequences. It really freaked me out sometimes, and I even feel weird thinking about it, even now. This truly frightening story occurred more than a decade ago, just when I was about to head into my teenage years. My friend and I were wandering around in the neighborhood I was living in, as we always did. We had strayed several blocks from the house we were staying at, when two dogs started barking up a storm at us as we passed their house. They were pit bulls. The dogs were digging around the ground under their fence, where it was clear it had been a place they had escaped before. We could tell the dogs were about to break out, so my friend and I started running. As we saw the dogs get up under the gate and start coming at us, we went into this person's yard and we shimmied up a tree which had branches for us to get up on. The dogs are now at the base of the tree barking, which made the owner of the yard we were in come out and then shoot the dogs away. As we were still in the tree, the owner, which looked to be about 50 years old, then started telling us to get into his garage so he could keep us safe. My friend and I just looked at each other knowing between our eyes this was danger. We proceeded to tell him that we were okay and we were going to head home. But he was at the base of the tree at this point, attempting to coax us into letting him help us down. The tone and mannerisms in the sky were truly sinister, and even as young boys, we could tell he was a predator. The man kept looking back and forth on the street just to make sure that nobody was watching this go down. But eventually someone walking their own dog down the road came along, and I said that was my relative. We jumped down as the man backed up, and we then ran up to this person like we knew them. I always wonder what would have happened if we had actually let the man keep us safe. 
First of all, I just want to say that if you don't explicitly know someone in real life, do not but tell my parents. Unfortunately, I had gotten rid of any trace of Hannah 28 on Snapchat, so I was unable to show them what I was talking about. At the very most, they thought it was weird because I had no evidence to back up what I was saying. If only I'd kept those videos, I could have told my parents to call the cops. Well, my week went by without any more weird happenings, and I couldn't be happier. But just a few weeks ago, I got a new notification on my Snapchat account, and I'm sure you can guess what it said. Hannah29 has added you. I am a 20-year-old female, but the story took place when I was 11. I was with my younger cousin, who was also a female, and was around eight years old at this time. We will call her Julie. Our small town was located on the outskirts of Rockford, Illinois. It has a notorious reputation for drugs, violent crime, and sex trafficking. I lived in a neighborhood with a Casey's gas station within walking distance. I would often go there with my friends to buy energy drinks, snacks, and junk food. I could go there pretty much whenever I wanted to, since nobody had to drive me there. My parents didn't keep too close of an eye on me, and I was a fairly self-sufficient kid for my age, which was definitely to my advantage in this experience. One night, Julie and I decided to have a sleepover at my house. I told my parents we were going to walk to the gas station to grab some drinks with my leftover birthday money. They were talking and drinking with my aunt and uncle and just sort of shoot us away. It took us maybe 10 to 15 minutes to walk there. As we were entering the parking lot, we saw a big semi-truck parked in front of the building. This wasn't that unusual, especially if supply is being dropped off. As we were walking past it, a middle-aged man came out of the gas station and asked us how we were doing. We were polite kids, so we stayed and talked with him for a couple of minutes. Do you girls like horses? We both replied, Yes. There are a couple of thoroughbreds in the trailer if you want to look at them real quick. Julie got really excited and instantly agreed and begins to make her way to the other side of the truck. I hesitated, feeling that something was really off about this situation for two reasons. One, there wasn't a diesel pump at this gas station, and this man didn't seem to be dropping off any supplies at the store. There was another gas station that did have diesel pumps less than a mile down the road. Two, the trailer wasn't the right kind for him to have horses in it. Horse trailers have large windows so that the horses can breathe and whatnot. If you were to put a horse inside the trailer that he was hauling, it would have suffocated. This was the biggest red flag for me. There was no way he actually had horses in his trailer. He took a step closer to us, and I began to panic before blurting out, uh, My dad is actually going to be here any minute, so we're in a bit of a hurry. Julie protested, knowing that this was a lie. I had to cover up by saying that he had texted me while we were walking. Oh... Are you girls sure you don't want to see them? It would only take a second. He said as he inched closer to us. I apologized to him, grabbed Julie by the arm, and pulled her into the gas station. I didn't stop there though. I dragged her all the way to the women's bathroom. All the while, she was complaining about not getting to see the horses. I had to tell her why I lied, and when she understood, she went quiet. After five minutes, I told her to wait there, and the Abba go see if the man was gone. As I peered through the window into the parking lot, I saw that the coast was clear. So we bought what we came for, and left with a bag in each of our arms. It was dark by this point, and to avoid any other interactions with strange people with dangerous propositions, we trespassed through a field instead of walking along the main road. We both figured that would be the better route from now on. We never told our parents about this encounter, 
because we didn't want them to say that we could no longer go by ourselves anymore. I know that sounds like a dumb reason, but I figured if I could sniff out one potential kidnapping, I could do the same if it were to ever happen again. I was a strange kid, and I really loved books, movies, and shows related to kidnapping. The point is, I felt like I could handle this kind of situation if it came my way again. Now that I'm older, I know that mindset was incredibly stupid, since I'm now aware of the gamble I was taking. I'm lucky that was the only time that I had ever felt unsafe there. I was 23 years old when this happened, and was living in the city of brotherly love at the time. Philadelphia. The girl I was dating lived about 35 to 40 minutes outside of the city, near West Chester. After hanging out for a while, I left her place around 12.30am. I really shouldn't have stayed out that late because I had an early shift that morning. As soon as I left her neighborhood, I noticed that my gas light was on. I put in directions to the nearest gas station on my GPS and drove 5 minutes to the local Wawa. I was familiar with this area. It was very low on crime, unlike many other places outside of Philly. So stopping here this late at night wasn't something that I was nervous about. There were two other cars parked there when I pulled in. I filled my tank and I realized that two of my tires were low on air. So I drove to the corner of the parking lot where they had the air pumps. I started working on my first tire. When I looked up and saw an older pickup truck pulling into the parking lot, I didn't think twice about it, until it drove up right next to my car. The truck began backing into the area where another air pump was. Any other day, I would have just assumed that it was somebody else trying to get air into their tires, but something gave me a bad feeling. The driver exited the truck. He looked to be in his late 50s, early 60s, and had scruffy facial hair and glasses. He looked like the stereotypical creep. He just stood by his driver's side door and stared at me. This was when I began to feel uneasy. Uh, is your pump out of order, sir? I asked, trying to break the tension. The man did not respond. He just kept giving me that cold stare. He finally moved away from the door and reached into the bed of his truck, his eyes never leaving me. He then produced a rope and began sprinting toward me. I immediately threw down the air nozzle and jumped into my car, which was already running. I threw it into drive, when suddenly, a hand slammed directly on my driver's side window and dragged sideways as I peeled out of there, leaving a smear. As I was driving home, my heart was pounding out of my chest for the first 10 minutes. I've never had anything like this happen to me. Two weeks later, a girl I was friends with on Instagram posted an article about multiple kidnappings in the Westchester area. I immediately thought back to that man in the truck. I'm thankful that I was able to escape. I almost became a statistic. This happened late one night, when I was driving back home from work, on a dark and lonely highway. It was the kind of night that makes you wish that you were at home relaxing, instead of being out on the road. There were no other cars in sight, and by happenstance, I was driving through dark territory, meaning that there was no reception on my phone. I had been driving for quite some time, and was starting to zone out a little bit. That's not to say that I was falling asleep behind the wheel. I was just sort of on autopilot. As I rounded a bend, I saw a semi-truck parked on the side of the road ahead of me. Not really anything out of the ordinary. Truckers will sometimes park off to the side to catch some shut-eye during their long trips across the country. But there was something about this truck that unnerved me. I got the feeling that whoever was behind the wheel wasn't resting. They were waiting. 
I slowed down as I approached the truck, and I tried to get a good look inside of the cab, but the windows were tinted and it was very dark out, so it was like looking into a black void. I also noticed that both the truck and the trailer were completely black. After passing the truck, I sped up and returned to my original speed. I didn't want to go too fast in case a trooper was hiding out somewhere, tagging passing cars. As I continued down the road, I kept thinking back to that strange truck I saw. I couldn't shake off the feeling that I was in some kind of danger. Perhaps it was just my overactive imagination. Damn it, get a hold of yourself. It was just a truck recounting sheep on the side of the road. Saying it out loud did not make it any more convincing. There was something off about that truck. As I was about to turn down another corner, I heard the unmistakable sound of an engine revving up behind me. I looked in my rearview mirror as a pair of headlights came up fast behind me. I panicked and pressed down on my gas pedal, but my car was nowhere near fast enough to outrun the truck. The headlights were now directly behind me, practically blinding me. My heart was pounding out of my chest. I knew that there was something up with that truck, but now I had to do everything I could to get away from it. But the road was narrow, with no side streets or exits in sight. I was trapped out here, with this massive 18-wheeler right behind me. Suddenly, a hidden trooper didn't sound too bad. As we continued down the road, the truck eventually slowed down and stayed a safe distance behind me, still not making any attempts to pass me. The truck then flicked off its headlights. Oh, hell no. I immediately sped up, looking into my rearview mirror. I could make out the vague silhouette of the truck getting further and further away as I floored it down the highway until it disappeared from view. When I finally arrived home safely, I parked my car in the driveway and went inside, making sure that all my doors and windows were locked. I was exhausted. Nothing takes it out of you like being afraid for your life out on a dark highway. I just wanted to get some sleep and put this entire thing behind me. About an hour later, I was woken up by the unmistakable sound of an idling engine coming from outside. Half asleep, I got up and looked out my window. I became fully awake once I saw what was parked outside, a black semi-truck parked in the road outside of my house. Not only was I terrified from my previous encounter, but what was equally jarring was that this massive truck was in a residential area. I have no idea how that driver maneuvered down the narrow streets. This was the first time I got a good look at the truck. It had no commercial markings on it whatsoever, so there was no chance of me calling a number to let the company know that one of their drivers is a psychopath with a bad case of road rage. Also, I never got a good look at the driver's tags, but I imagine they would have read, beating you. I mentally could not handle seeing the truck outside of my house. I just remember saying, no. And crawling back into bed, I didn't have the energy to deal with this insane shit. I just remembered hearing the truck pulling away as I drifted off to sleep. To this day, I'm still not sure if the driver somehow found out where I lived or if it was just a very vivid nightmare. The next morning, I considered calling the police to report the strange encounter, but honestly, what were they going to do? There was no damage to my car, and there was no proof of what happened out there on the highway. Over the next few weeks, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being followed. I became severely paranoid, constantly looking over my shoulder and freaking out every time I saw a dark colored truck. One day, I was walking back from the grocery store, and I saw a black semi parked on the side of the road. After nearly having a panic attack, I was put at ease once I saw the commercial markings on the side of its trailer. I realized that it was just another semi-truck with a black paint job. What happened to me that night was terrifying. 
but the fear that it caused me was taking over my ability to be rational. After a while, I could not allow it to control me anymore, and I eventually had to move on with my life. It's been years, but I still think about that black semi-truck from time to time. Ultimately, this experience has taught me to trust my instincts, and to be extremely cautious when driving alone on remote roads. I still wonder who was behind the wheel of that truck, and what their intentions were. When you go off to college, a lot of people warn you about the dangers that can occur on campus, but what no one warns you about is the ride home. While I'm sure most people have fun and possibly even memorable rides home from school with their family, mine was only memorable because I made it home with my life. It was the beginning of December and the fall semester had just ended. And at the time, I had made plans with some friends back at home to go see the midnight release of a movie that was coming out instead of taking my exams and then driving home the next day. I planned to drive home as soon as I finished my schoolwork. This meant that I left campus around 4 in the afternoon. I would make it to the mall for the movie just in time. So I did just that. I left right after my last test, and I could not have been more excited to see my friends. I had about a six and a half hour drive ahead of me, so I got comfortable and began making my way home as quickly but safely as possible. Now that being said, even though I was in a rush, I was still raised to be helpful. I was always taught growing up that if you saw someone on the side of the road, you stop and ask if they need help. Sometimes people don't need anything and you just keep driving, but you never know when someone might need you. So at around 9.30 at night, as I was driving along this dimly lit back road, when I saw a car parked on the side of the road, I didn't even hesitate. I pulled over and hopped out of my car to ask if they needed any help. Right away, I could see the car was being driven by an elderly man, and he claimed that his car had a flat tire on the passenger side, and asked me if I would help him put the spare on for him. I told him of course, and asked him to pop the trunk so I could get the tire out, and he did. But as I leaned into the trunk to lift up the mat that covers the spare, I felt the man press something against my neck. My entire body tensed up as I could feel the shocks from the taser that he just pressed against me fired. I keeled over forward and the man was able to easily push me and force me into the trunk of his car before slamming it shut. I recovered from being tased before we pulled off from the side of the road. But as I reached above me for the emergency handle that it's in most trunks, I couldn't find it. I could feel the tires moving as we began making our way down the secluded back street when I realized the old man had forgotten to take my phone before locking me up. He must have been in such a hurry and didn't want to risk being overpowered that it didn't even cross his mind. I squirmed around in the trunk until I could get my hand into my pocket and pull my phone out. After calling the police and telling them what road I was just on, it was only a matter of a couple of minutes before they were able to find me. I heard the sound of police sirens behind us as they pulled the elderly man over, and once the car came to a stop, I began banging on the trunk to let the officers know where I was. Once the man was in custody and I was out of the trunk, I asked the officer if he knew why the man tried to abduct me, but he didn't know why. It wasn't until the trial that we learned that this man, who I thought was old and frail, had actually confessed to abducting multiple people between the 90s and the late 2000s. I was just the lucky one. About four years ago, when I was in college, I went to a university that was about two hours away from my girlfriend's college. I would drive down to her campus sometimes on Friday afternoons, and then we would hang out for the weekend. I would typically leave to go back on Sunday night. Usually, I would try to leave by 10 p.m. at the latest on Sunday nights to get back to my dorm on campus by midnight. I had a 9 a.m. class on Mondays after all, but many times I would stay later than I should. One time, I stayed until nearly midnight and then began driving back to my campus. Unfortunately, not long after I started driving back, maybe like 20 minutes, I began to feel very sleepy. I kept going and hoped that I would feel more awake, but I was only getting more and more tired as I went on. 
I was starting to struggle to keep my eyes open, and obviously it was becoming a very dangerous situation. Then I decided that I needed to stop and do something to help myself wake up, maybe get an energy drink or something. I kept my eyes open to the sides of the road to see if I would pass by any gas stations or rest stops. I knew that I wouldn't be able to make it much farther without falling asleep. At the next exit, I took it and I hoped that I would come across something. The exit led me down to a quiet road and not too far down it appeared to be a gas station. I was really happy to see it. I pulled into the parking lot, but when I did, it appeared that the store part of the gas station was closed. The lights were off inside and there were no cars in the parking lot whatsoever. I even got out and tried the door, but it was locked. I went back to my car then and got inside. I was still extremely tired. That's when I just sat back and closed my eyes. I wasn't thinking all that clearly from being so tired, and I guess I felt that maybe I could take a brief 15 minute nap or something. All I know is when I closed my eyes, it felt so good. I started to drift off to sleep and I was out within probably 15 seconds. The next thing I knew, I was waking up to see a car was parked next to me. I was groggy and I almost went right back to sleep at first, but I had a bad feeling. The feeling was almost like I needed to get away from there and I was in danger. I looked at the car that was parked next to me. It was a silver sedan and it looked to be about 20 years old or so. Then the driver's door opened. I felt a little bit suspicious because they parked right next to me out of all the other spaces in the parking lot. I could barely see the person as they walked around the car over to mine. When they made it around, I finally saw them. It was a man wearing a white sweatshirt with his hood up and he had on like a type of mask that covered his whole face. It was like a costume mask of some sort, but I didn't recognize the character. When he approached my driver's window, I had no interest to stick around. I started my car up right then, and as I did, the man attempted to open my driver's door. My door was locked though, and I put my car into reverse and then backed up and drove away from him. I saw him then start sprinting back to his car as I was speeding out of the parking lot. Suddenly, I was wide awake and I didn't feel like sleeping at all. I sped onto the road and then back onto the freeway. I wasn't driving recklessly or anything, but I was definitely pushing the speed limit. When I got back onto the freeway, I saw that a car was merging right behind me, which happened to be the silver car. I had no plans to try to outrun them and I drove at a normal pace. The guy sped up until he was right behind me. He got within probably five feet of the back of my car and he stayed at that pace for a good minute or so. There were no other cars on the freeway at all. This area was really not that populated. In fact, most of the drive from my girlfriend's college to mine was just farms and woodland. I don't think I had seen another car the entire time that I was on the freeway. I sped up just a little bit, and as soon as I did, the guy behind me did as well. I switched lanes back and forth once, and he did the same. Then he sped up and hit the back end of my car. I couldn't believe it. He then crashed into it again, but this time harder. I think this guy had to be crazy or something. Then he backed off and then went forward and hit me for a third time. This time, it was so hard that I nearly lost control of my car entirely and spun out. I sped up then because I was desperate, but as I did, I noticed way up ahead that there appeared to be a semi-truck. I kept speeding up and so did the guy behind me. When we got sort of close to the semi, the guy behind me then switched lanes and sped off passing both me and the semi-truck. He probably went over 100 miles per hour when he passed the truck. I slowed back down again once I made it to the semi-truck. The truck honked at me, probably seeing the damage on the back side of my car. I slowed down more and then called the police about the situation. I'm not sure why I didn't think to call the police sooner, but it's probably best or I might have crashed or something trying to handle the phone and driving. An officer came out and pulled me over where I was able to give my side of the story. He had me take the next exit and then stayed with me while I called my roadside service. I basically ended up staying up all night from waiting for my car to get towed and everything. I'm not sure whatever happened to the driver of the other car, whoever he was. I would recommend everybody to not drive late at night unless you have to, and especially never drive if you're tired. I'm 27 and currently out of work. I recently got laid off at my job as the company I worked for was starting to go under. So in an effort to keep up with the bills, I started delivering for Uber Eats part time. A couple of my friends suggested it and so I figured I'd give it a try until I found another job. To my surprise, it was actually good money. The only thing I didn't like was some of the places the app had me delivered to. I live in a city with a lot of sketchy areas. 
I try to stay away from those areas while delivering, but there's only so much you can do. This night, a Saturday, I got a McDonald's order. I usually don't accept those ones, but this night was strangely dead. Which was weird, Saturday nights are usually the busiest for Uber Eats. Anyway, I pick up the order and start heading towards the address I'm given. Instantly, I realized it was not in the best area. But by this point, I decided to just suck it up. I pulled up to the house, and right away the vibe was off. It was completely dark with not a single light on in the house. Usually there's at least a light on upstairs, or something that would signal someone being awake and waiting for their order. But the house seemed dead. Nevertheless, I put the car in park, turned off the engine, grabbed the order, and started walking towards the door. I walked onto the porch, and as I reached for the front door, I saw it. The door was slightly cracked open. I knocked, and as I did, the door opened slightly more. I yelled out that I had an Uber Eats order, and right away, some man walked to the front door, like as if he had just been waiting right there. As he got closer, I got a good look at him. Now, I'm not one to judge a person by their physical appearance, but this guy was practically covered head to toe in tattoos. The guy looked extremely intimidating, definitely not someone you'd want to mess with. He had this look of frustration, or almost anger on his face. He was staring at me dead in the eyes. I lifted up the bag of food, and he grabbed it. The guy then started reaching in his pocket. I figured he was going to give me a tip. But no, before I knew it, the guy was holding a hunting knife and pointing it in my direction. My stomach dropped, realizing the situation I was now in. I was either going to get robbed for everything I had, or worst case scenario, killed. My mind was now racing. Thinking as fast as I could, I turned around towards my car, screamed at Derek to grab the gun, and put my hand in my pocket to start my car's engine from a button on the key. But there was no Derek, and I was in no way armed. But I figured if I could somehow convince this guy I was, I gave myself a chance to get out of this. All I could do was pray that the threat along with the vehicle starting would be enough to convince this guy I didn't come here alone. And luckily it was. The guy shoved me back and slammed the front door. I ran back to my car and practically tore the door off trying to get in. I got out of there as fast as I could. I would of course end up calling the police, but I never heard anything back about whatever ended up happening. I assumed they didn't find anything, and that the guy was long gone by the time they arrived on scene. But I can't confirm this. If there's one thing I'm sure of, it's how fortunate I am to own a car with a remote proximity key, as I don't think the guy would have bought the whole act if I didn't start the engine. I still drive for Uber Eats every once in a while, but I've since started carrying a knife on me at all times. So the first event goes down when I took a delivery to a nice big house in a peaceful suburban neighborhood. This middle-aged guy had to be in his late 50s or 60s, answers the door and invites me in while he goes to grab his wallet. Any other time, I'd have opted to stay outside on the porch, but the house was seriously impressive looking from the outside that I wanted to check out what kind of interiors it had going on. So I follow him to his back porch but stop dead in my tracks when I notice the large TV screen that's playing some kind of hardcore adult movie. When he noticed I had stopped and that it was making me uncomfortable, he didn't bother to apologize or turn it off. In fact, he seemed to like the idea that he was basically forcing me to watch something so sleazy and beckoned me to come out onto the porch to join him. Naturally, I declined, got the money, and left. The other thing happened at an extended stay hotel that had a real bad rep, mostly from fellow delivery drivers who ended up getting robbed or jumped. So I follow the delivery instructions and head around to a side door where I find I actually needed a code to get in. Luckily, a guy sticks his head out of the window and says the pizza's for him, adding that he'll be right down to pick it up. As I'm waiting for the guy to let me in, someone else comes along and lets me in, so I ended up meeting the guy on the stairs. Now, rather than exchanging money and leaving as you might expect, the guy tells me he doesn't have the money. Some other guy back in the room has it and asks me to come upstairs with him. With the first red flag tingling in the back of my head, I step into the elevator with him. The doors close, and he says something to the effect of, Hey, check this out, and begins to lift his shirt. Second 
and third red flags here. Under his shirt, he's been wrapped with bandages around his stomach. I'll save you the graphic details, but it was obviously a bad wound. A stab wound, if I had to guess. He proceeds to confirm that he was in fact stabbed the other night, and that it was on the news and that I might have seen it, and after a pause in the conversation, that it hurts a lot. With the most awkward silence ever, we step off the elevator, go to his room, and he pops inside before coming back to invite me inside. Now two thoughts go through my mind. Either this is the dumbest setup for a robbery I'd ever seen, or the couch guy is really, really lazy. I eventually settle on the fact that if this were a robbery, the guy probably wouldn't have advertised this gaping stab wound and I kind of wanted to meet the laziest man in the world. So I step in the door, careful not to let freshly mixed stab wounds get my back. Inside, there's an older white-haired man on the couch and a young tweaked-out girl. The man hands the money to the girl and, naturally, it's a hundred-dollar bill and that's the only cash she has. So reluctantly, I make change for him out of my own money, conclude the transaction, and hastily retreat from what I can only assume was some kind of meth house. Because my parents had separated before I was born, I spent my time growing up between each of their houses. Each summer, until I turned 19, I stayed with my dad in rural Missouri. He had grown up in the area himself and most of his family still lived there. Without much to do, like going to the movies and stuff, I would fill my days hanging out with my older cousin and getting into mischief. Many of our long summer days were taken in wandering the surrounding woods. On one of these journeys, we came across a big lake setting quietly by itself out in the middle of nowhere. The water was crystal clear and filled with tons of monstrous fish. We asked the adults if they were aware of its existence, but none had heard of it. That was probably the reason for it having so many large fish. No one living in the area had fished it, and any who had in the past allowed its location to be lost. We would fish the pond three or four times, coming away with a stringer full of lunkers on each occasion. On the fifth occasion, we hoped to accumulate enough for a big family fish fry. The summer holiday was starting to wind down and we figured a fish fry would be a great way to cap it off. It was a warm Saturday morning when we headed out. We started about an hour before sunup because the walk-in took over an hour. Besides, the fish stopped biting by the hottest part of the day and we hoped to get back to my dad's house by early afternoon. The beautiful sight of the pond came into view around dawn. It didn't take long for us to get our first bites, and for the next three hours, the fish came quickly, one after another. Our limit was caught by 10.45, and I was rearing to get going. We had a 90-minute walk back with two five-gallon buckets packed to the top with fish, so I imagined another 30 could be added to that. To my displeasure, my cousin thought it would be refreshing to take a dip in the lake before we left. He tried to pressure me into joining him, but I didn't know how to swim at the time. I just wanted to get back, but he was older than me, so he was in charge. I plopped my tail onto a rock and waited while he did his thing. There was an old rope tied to a tree, probably from a hundred years ago, and he wanted to swing from it. It looked unsafe to me. However, my concerns were laughed off, and... He stripped down to his boxers, setting his clothes on the ground next to me. He climbed the tree a little way and grabbed the rope. Pushing off, he swung out just a short distance before the rope snapped right above him. He'd made it out far enough to hit the deep water, but probably not as far as he intended. When he hit the water, his body made a dull thud sound. It certainly didn't sound normal and likely hurt. I was planning on laughing at him and saying I told you so, but as the seconds pass, he never resurfaced. The situation was quickly becoming scary. I looked around to see if he came up somewhere farther away, perhaps floating unconscious because of the hard contact with the water, but still nothing. I began to panic and waded out as far as I dare looking into the water for him. Unfortunately, the water became cloudy with every step I took and made it impossible to see. Soon it was clear to me that he had drowned. How, I 
had no idea. Perhaps if I could have swum back then, I may have been able to help him, but it was too late now. I was helpless to do anything more than pack up and head home. On the entire walk back, a small nugget of hope lingered in the back of my mind that he had tricked me and would pop up at some point. This didn't happen, however, and the dread I carried of telling my family grew with each step. I tried several times to find the words, but with each attempt, I would break down and choke on my tears. Ultimately, I could only manage Mark drowned. They got the point after that, and once I was able to pull myself together, I led my dad and uncle back out to the pond. Mark's body was still nowhere to be found. With no other options, we went into the sheriff's office to report the drowning. When I realized where we were headed, I started freaking out. In my young mind, I thought I was going to get in trouble or be blamed for my cousin's death. It took a few minutes, but they were able to convince me I wasn't in trouble. Even after they had, I couldn't help but feel guilty every time I looked at my uncle. Regardless of what he claimed, I couldn't believe he didn't blame me, even if it was just a small amount. I explained what had happened to the sheriff and the search began the next morning. Just by chance, that was the day I was going back to my mom's. That Monday night, my mom sat me down to tell me that a team of divers had found Mark's body earlier that day. When they discovered him, one of his feet were hung up on a sunken log, so they assumed that was why he never resurfaced. I wish I could say this made me feel better, but it did not. It did, however, serve as a catalyst to learn how to swim. The guilt of not being able to help my cousin stayed with me for most of my life, and I never wanted to be in the position of not being able to help another person ever again. So in a twisted kind of way, his death had a positive impact on my life. However, if I had the choice, I'd still prefer that he be with us. Although what I'm about to tell you may sound like one of your run-of-the-mill horror movies, I swear by the validity of it and what I saw. It all started on a very hot July day this past year. My car is almost 20 years old and sometimes overheats on hot days, just like this one. However, until I get a better paying job, it's the car I'm stuck with. This day, I was driving through the back roads looking for a family of dog breeders a friend had told me about. i have been searching for the place for several hours and was approaching the warmest part of the day. As per usual, my car began overheating and I was forced to pull over. I picked up my phone to call my girlfriend only to see that my battery was dead. After I spent a couple of minutes cussing my luck, I acknowledged that I was going to have to find someone with a working phone. That wasn't going to happen unless I started walking. Soon, I spotted an old farmhouse off in the distance and headed toward it. A trip that would have taken half an hour on a normal day took almost an hour because of the oppressive heat. I had to take several breaks during the course of the journey, but eventually made it. The area around the house looked more like a junkyard. Parts of old cars spread about, and I had to weave through a maze of them to reach the front door. I knocked on the door for several minutes, but got no answer. Thinking maybe that the homeowner may be hard of hearing... I walked around and looked into the windows hoping to see someone inside. At the side of the house I spotted the telephone hanging on the wall just inside the kitchen. Now that I knew that there was a phone I became excited and started calling out for someone. Even after walking all the way around, no reply came. I was about to give up until I saw a woman lying on a bed. I very nearly banged on the window to try and get her attention but I figured that may scare her so I went to the front door and let myself in. Now in hindsight, that was just as scary. But before I entered, however, I took a piece of paper from a notebook I carry with me and wrote out a note explaining what I was doing there. Even then, I called out several times as I approached the bedroom. Still no answer came and I continued toward the room. The closer I got to the woman, the more her appearance began to unnerve me. She was laying flat on her back and staring blankly at the ceiling. 
I had initially believed she was watching the television that was turned on in the room with her, but her eyes sat completely still. Regardless, I got closer and, once I was within a few steps, handed her the note. When the note touched her hand, she didn't react. This caused me to get closer and this was when I realized something was very wrong. Her face had a very dry, almost mummified look to it. Her hair was a vibrant black, a color not often seen on older females. She had to have known I was there by that point, but her eyes stayed fixed. This is what caused me to lean in even closer and look into her eyes. Rather than being slightly bloodshot or moist looking like most people's, they had a shiny, glassy appearance, like they were fake. In spite of this, not until I actually touched her did I know for sure that she was dead. I realized that perhaps she was a mannequin rather than a human, so I reached down to touch her bare hand. The texture of her skin was dry, but stone cold to the touch. The oddity of this was just beginning to really sink in, when a loud creaking noise came from behind me. Without a second thought, I tore out of there and ran back down the road in the direction of my car. Within a half of a mile, I ran into an older man in a truck, and thankfully he agreed to give me a ride back into town. I said nothing about my experience to him, and any time he attempted to make small talk, I said as little as I could, on the off chance that he may have been involved in what happened to that woman. He let me borrow his phone to call my girlfriend and she agreed to meet us at a gas station on the edge of town. When he let me out there, I thanked him and he went on his way. Once I was safely inside my girlfriend's car, I borrowed her phone to call the police. I hadn't even told her about it yet, so the look of shock on her face as I described what I saw showed me what my expression likely was at the time I discovered it. The cops said they'd send out a car to the house to check out my claims. I called a wrecker next to pick up my car. The police never called me back, so after waiting three days, I called to inquire about what they found. It took a few minutes to find a person aware of my call, but once I did, the officer said that he and his partner searched the entire property and found nothing out of the ordinary, especially not a mummified woman. I thanked them and hung up. What happened after I fled, I can only guess. The noise behind me was probably the owner of the home, and he hid the woman's body knowing that the cops were likely to be called. To tell you the truth, I'm not sure what I saw in that house, on that bed. I am positive that I saw a human lying on that bed, but that's all. More than once, I've been tempted to grab a camera and return to the house to get proof of my claims, but fear of the unknown and what else could be waiting for me if I did has stopped me. If the nightmares of her soulless eyes continue, however, I may have no other choice. This happened about five years ago now. I had just gotten through a really rough breakup of a codependent relationship. So I was going through a phase of trying to be more independent, self-sufficient, and just generally more okay with being alone. I would go to a lot of movies, restaurants, etc. all by myself. At the time, I was living in Montana where spending time outdoors is a prime recreation. Camping solo seemed like it would be a really good exercise in truly being self-reliant. So I packed a little tent and went to Jerry Johnson Hot Springs. Jerry Johnson is a natural hot springs with a few small, mostly natural pools in the mountains on the border of Montana and Idaho. I'm going to try and keep this as brief as possible, so I won't go on explaining the place. What I will say, however, is that it's truly in the middle of nowhere. From the interstate, it's about a one-third mile hike across the bridge and into the woods. And from the interstate, it's about a 45 minute drive in either direction before you reach any kind of civilization in the form of a gas station. There isn't a motel or anything attached to the hot springs like there are with some. It's really just forest land with a few tiny ponds of warm water and if you ever go, you'll probably be the only person there. 
There's plenty of daylight, so I decide I'll go soak first and then set up my camp when I'm finished. I make the short hike to find that there's a couple, a man and a woman around their 30s in the main pool, and they look kind of startled to see me. I say a friendly hello from a distance as I then approach. At first, they don't really respond, they just kind of stare at me. Then the guy pipes up. What are you doing, man? I then tell him that I'm really confused and I don't know what he means. The man then asks, Are you the one that's been creeping around the woods and watching us for the last hour or so? I assured them that I didn't know what they were talking about and they begin to tell me that there's someone in the woods way off of the trail. Apparently they'd been yelling at him and he just doesn't respond. He'll walk away into the woods for a while and then reappear somewhere else just watching them. After they've been assured that it isn't me, I get undressed and get into the water. The pupils in their eyes were huge. I'm guessing that they ate some magic mushrooms. I never asked, but it seemed pretty obvious. It's not a big deal. It's basically the perfect setting for something like that, but it makes me think that they might just be having a bad trip. We talk for a while and first about the creepy guy and then about some other stuff. The mood lightens and they seem pretty relieved not to be alone. I'm a relatively large guy and I guess there's strength in numbers. No more sightings of the creeper. They get out of the pool before me. I'm in the pool all by myself for about 10 minutes before I then hear some shouting in the woods. I decide to cut my soak short just in case someone's in trouble. I get out, dry off quickly and then get dressed, still mostly wet when I then hear another shout. I then start quickly hiking. I eventually come across the couple that was shouting off into the woods and saying things like, Hey man, we have a gun. Which they didn't. I ask what's going on and they say that the guy was just ominously standing in the path looking at them way off in the distance. When they started to shout at him, he left the path again and then retreated into the woods. Now he's out of sight. Through all of this happening, they never get a good look at him. We walk back to our cars. We decide that we're all going to camp near each other. There's an official campground, but you have to pay. The guy tells me that he knows about another spot that's relatively flat that would probably work for us. I agree, and I decide to follow them. It's not very far. They set up their tent, and I set up mine about 100 yards away. I wanted to give them plenty of space to trip or whatever, and I was out there in the first place to camp alone. We were in a dry season on raw forest floor, so neither of us made a campfire. I got all set up and just sat around reading a book, really enjoying all of the nature. The mosquitoes made me retreat into my tent at about 6 p.m., and by 9 I was sound asleep. At about midnight, I was then awoken by the sound of screaming. I grabbed my flashlight and my 22 pistol, put on my shoes but didn't tie them, and then started running toward the other tent. When I arrived, the two were standing outside of the tent with their own flashlights and completely losing it. They said that the guy had been there and that we all needed to get the crap out of there ASAP. They showed me a slice in the wall of their tent that he had made with a knife. They then haphazardly packed all of their stuff in a hurry and we went back to the cars. I only then realized that I hadn't actually grabbed any of my own stuff. I asked if they would go back with me to get it, and they basically just said, Sorry dude, you're on your own. Then got in their car and took off. I then thought about it for a minute. I could come back the next day and get my stuff, but it was over an hour drive in each direction, and I was there now. I did have a gun, but if I shot someone in the woods, even if self-defense, that would be the beginning of another nightmare that would probably last the rest of my life. I made the decision and decided to go back for my stuff. I killed my flashlight and basically went stealth ninja mode back into the tree surrounding the clearing where my tent was. My thought was that if I was really quiet then I could probably hear him but he couldn't hear me. It took me about 20 minutes to get where my tent was since I was moving so slowly. When I got back to my tent it was totally untouched. I quickly threw on my backpack, put my flashlight in my mouth grabbed my tent in its fully assembled state with my sleeping bag still inside of it and then ran back to the car with a loaded 22 revolver in my hand. 
I went back to my car, started it, and drove away. What didn't really occur to me until later is that I never actually saw this guy, and to this day, I can't really be sure that there was actually anyone in the woods at all. I really kind of doubt that these people would have sliced their own tent, but at the same time, I kind of doubt that there was actually just a dude hanging out in the wilderness all day and night just to freak these campers out. It's really possible that the two campers were really just messing around with me. If so, they really deserve Oscars for their performance, as they really seem genuinely terrified. I guess I'll never really know though. I remembered something that had happened to my best friend and I a few years ago, and I figured I would share it here. While my best friend and I were seniors in high school, we went on a weekend trip to visit my grandmother a couple hours away from my town in Georgia. The town that we lived in was comparatively small for the state, but one of the biggest towns within a few hours. But we had to travel about two and a half hours through tiny, somewhat redneck towns to get to my grandmother's place. We were on our way back home when we had to stop at a gas station literally in the middle of nowhere. I'm talking cornfields, cotton fields, streets with no signs or lights, not even stop signs, and definitely no cell service. The convenience store that was attached to the gas station had maybe a couple snacks inside but looked deserted from the outside, and we decided not to bother to get anything other than gas. I paid with card, mainly because I didn't want to leave my 5 foot 1 100 pound friend all alone in the car while I went alone inside. Another car had pulled up on the other side of the single gas pump while I just started pumping my gas, and because of everything I'd read before on Let's Not Meet, I already had a really weird feeling and decided to stay alert and stand outside of the car with my driver's side door wide open. The reason I did this was so that my friend could see and hear everything that was going on. A thin late 50s-ish older man got out of the car and seemed to be paying at the pump and standing beside his car while he got gas. But after a few seconds, he walked around the pump and then maneuvered himself around my car door to stand within a foot of me and asked if he could pump my gas for me. Luckily, the gas nozzle was locked, so it was pumping without me having to hold it. I immediately placed myself between the opening of the door and the man, and I prepared to either shut the door with me inside it, or move and slam it behind me to protect my friend if necessary. I calmly told him it was fine and no thank you. He looked me up and down with the corner of his lip tilted up and then said, You know, pretty girls like you shouldn't be out here all alone and you definitely shouldn't have to do this by yourself. Let a man help you, baby." And then proceeded to cover my hand with his own as he reached for the gas pump that I was holding. I jerked my hand out from underneath his and then slammed my car door shut. I then jerked my hand out from underneath his and slammed my car door shut, thinking the last thing that I would want is him jumping in my car and driving away with my friend in the passenger seat. Red flags were totally going off now. My typical overly polite demeanor turned serious, as I remember something that I'd read here that said that it was better to be safe and to seem mean rather than be polite and uncomfortable. So I then responded and said, Sir, get away from me. I can pump my own gas and I've already said no thank you. Leave us alone. He didn't move, only raised his chin and managed to make eye contact with me. His tilted lip totally gone now. I stared him down and I figured I'd gotten enough gas to last us enough time to get the crap out of wherever we were. So I made eye contact, pulled the nozzle out, and basically threw it back into the pump before getting in my car and driving away before he had even moved. As we drove away, I glanced in the rear view and saw that his car wasn't even being filled up with gas. So I'm guessing he was just driving by and then decided to help out a damsel in distress even though I was nowhere even close to being a damsel in distress. My friend was shaking the whole way home, telling me she would have just let the man pump our gas. But I'm really glad of some of the confidence that I'd gained from this sub. It helped me stay attentive and respond confidently enough to get out of that crazy situation. So to the creepy, helpful gas station man in the middle of Ghost Town, Georgia, hopefully we won't meet ever again. I was helping my boyfriend move from Wisconsin to Colorado. 
I had driven out to Wisconsin and picked up some of his stuff while he carried the rest of it in his own car. So we were driving separately. Somewhere in the middle of Nebraska towards the end of the day, we found out that his car was having some issues that would need to be repaired before we could make the rest of the trip to Colorado. We decided to stay at the motel for the night and find somewhere to repair the car at in the morning. We took the car into the shop and it was actually able to be repaired before the end of the day. The shop called my boyfriend to let him know he could come pick it up, so I drove him out there. When we got to the shop, I realized that I would left my phone at the motel. I wasn't too worried as even though I wasn't too familiar with the area, I figured I could follow my boyfriend as he drove back to the motel for the night. As I saw my boyfriend exit the shop in his car, other cars shortly followed behind him, so I lost track of him. I decided to try and find the way back to the motel on my own, to the best of my memory. It was pretty much just straight down the main road until you saw the sign for the motel on the left side. I kept driving down the main road until I realized I had never even seen the motel sign. I was lost and I really started to panic as I had no phone and I had no idea how to get back to the motel. I began to notice a white SUV that was following my car for about 5 minutes. He eventually pulled into the lane to the left of me. Sitting at a stoplight, I saw the man in the white SUV motion to roll down my window. Being confused and not really knowing how to react, I rolled it down. Hey, what are you doing? He said. Uh, nothing, I replied, not really sure why he was asking this. Well, why don't you uh, pull over and come talk to me for a second? After hearing this, I quickly shook my head and then rolled up the window. The last thing that I wanted was to be stranded in this town with some weird stranger following me. The light turned green and that's when I saw my boyfriend's car then pull up right behind mine. I then pulled off into the closest parking lot, to which my boyfriend followed. Luckily, the SUV was nowhere in sight. He said he was trying to catch up and find my car once he didn't see me at the motel. I let him drive me back that night so we could return for my car in the morning. Thank goodness my boyfriend had found me at the right time, as I'm not really sure what would have happened that night if he hadn't have found me, and if that man in the SUV had followed me any further. A few years back, I decided to move out of my mother's house. I had a girlfriend at the time, and eventually she moved in with me. We were both 19, and we were still in the honeymoon phase of our relationship. Where we lived was pretty small and only had a few restaurants. And the other thing was, we were introverts, so we liked staying in our apartment. Being that we always stayed in our apartment and lived in a small town, we always ordered DoorDash from the same places. We didn't have many choices. One night we were in bed and I was feeling a little frisky. I turned on a Nightmare Files YouTube video because his voice usually gets her in the mood. So that's exactly what happened, like clockwork. I turned on one of his videos and she was all over me. Anyway, we were hungry and I ordered some food on DoorDash. While waiting for our food, my girlfriend fell asleep. She was worn out. There was a wing stop near our place and I would always order from there. It was always the same dasher every time. So there was some trust there. In the delivery instructions, I put the code to get in the building. I picked the option where it cost more to get there quicker, but 30 minutes went by and still nothing. I was already notified that my food was picked up about 15 minutes ago. But then I noticed that the delivery driver was right by my apartment building on the DoorDash map and has been there for about eight minutes already. I looked outside my third story window and I saw the same car that always delivers here. The lights were on and the car was running. I went to my bathroom real quick and all of a sudden I heard my buzzer go off as if someone was at the front door downstairs and wants to get in. That's weird because the only person I was expecting was the door dasher and he has the code. I walked to the intercom and I said, uh, 
Hello? Can I help you? Yeah, it's your door dasher and I, I got jumped by some guy. He took my phone and the screen was unlocked, so you, at this time you should maybe call the cops. He's on his way up to your apartment. I buzzed the actual dasher up and as he was saying that, there was a knock at my door. All I heard after this was, Hey, it's uh, your door dasher. I have your order. I didn't say anything. Then another knock. I told him to just leave it and then he said, Nah, I can wait. The people around here look pretty sketchy. I then told him it's okay and I'm not dressed. I told him to leave after that. Then there was a pause. So, what exactly are you wearing? And the guy started messing with the door handle trying to get in. I had a complete brain fart. I forgot to call the cops. At the same time, my girlfriend is limping out of our room, asking what was going on. Then I heard tussling and fighting outside our apartment door. I told her to go in our room and call the cops. I opened the door and the DoorDash guy was getting choked and beat up on the ground by the crazy guy. So I did what anyone else would do in the situation. I closed the door and I ran back in the apartment. That dude was so big. There was no need for both of us to get beat up or killed, so I'm good. I heard the fighting stop, and then there were more knocks at the door. Hey, it's uh, the door dasher. I have your order. I thought to myself that this guy was out of his freaking mind. My girlfriend yelled from the other room that the police should be here soon. I looked out of my peephole as we were waiting, and the guy was just standing there while the real DoorDash guy was laid out on the floor. The cops got there pretty quick and arrested the guy. When they got there, DoorDash guy stood up and he told them what happened. So when he pulled up, he was updating something in his phone for DoorDash. As he stood outside of his car, all of a sudden, some guy came out of nowhere and smacked him a few times, then he punched him and knocked him out. He took his phone and the food and went to the apartment. I don't know who that guy was and why he chose us, but I'm glad that DoorDash warned us. I've never had anything like this happen to me before, so I'm not sure perhaps I'm overthinking it. I'm a relatively short girl, which is why I didn't even want to go outside and see if it was just a matter of the guy wanting to personally hand over the food. So yesterday at around 5 a.m., my friend had ordered me some DoorDash. We always put the leave at the door option, especially when it's in the morning, so it just turns into a matter of waiting for the dasher to leave. However, the guy I got yesterday scared the hell out of me. We had gotten a DoorDash notification that the food was dropped off, ready for pickup. I didn't notice until later, but there was no picture. I was just about to walk out, but before I opened the door, I looked out the window when I noticed that he was just standing there, not on his phone, not trying to see if he was at the right house, nothing. No kind of movement, just standing there. I was a bit confused, so I told my friend. I asked if she had put the leave at the door option and she said she had. So I waited a bit before she decided to call and remind him to just leave it at the door. I could see his phone lighting up, but he never answered. He ignored every call and every text. He even answered once and immediately hung up on her. It wasn't even a matter of stealing my food. If that was the case, he would have just drove off with it. He spent a while waiting. And at one point, I almost went out when I no longer saw him, but I realized that he was just standing behind one of the bushes. Then he just sat in his car across the street, waiting. He hadn't even left the food at the fence. He just took it with him and he waited in his car. He even drove off angrily, almost like he was upset that I didn't go out to see. So when he drove off, that was around the same time that he hung up on my friend. All the times that he waited, you know, outside, outside the fence, behind the bush, and at his car, it lasted around 10 to 15 minutes each. I had no doubt that this guy was up to something. He was a little weird. 
Then that was confirmed a few days later when I saw that a DoorDash driver tried kidnapping a little girl when she came out to get her food. And it was that same guy. Not gonna lie, that was one of the weirdest nights of my life. This happened about a year and a half ago. I was at work, you know, night shift, a little past midnight, and I ordered some DoorDash for myself and my supervisor since it was her birthday. I was happy to see that I had the same driver as last time. As I work in a small building among other identical buildings with a convoluted road system in between them all, it can be a little confusing to someone not used to it. I had been watching the map and went outside when I saw that he was close. I stood under a cluster of bright lights in our parking lot, wearing neon yellow. You couldn't miss me. I immediately get a call from my driver asking me to come to him. I look around and I don't see anyone until I walk a couple yards to the center of the lot. He's sitting on the side of my building by the dumpster where there's no light. He also has his lights off. I'm thinking, what the hell, dude? I start waving my arms and telling him I'm in front of the building and he's on the side. He hangs up and just chills there for a minute. At this point, I'm really annoyed because our food is getting cold and this guy delivered to me before in the same exact spot a week before. Finally, he turns his lights on and comes over to me. As soon as he pulls up, he's speaking another language into his phone, which then translates in English. Something like, Hello, I'm practicing English. I need new friends. Will you be my friend? And then he puts the phone toward me. I feel like I'm speaking to a child and I just say, oh, that's a cool app. And I look at him, just waiting. We just stared at each other for a few seconds. I keep speaking into the app about needing friends and I tell him that my supervisor is waiting for me. And I reach my hand out for the food. So when he reaches out, he actually touches my hand and then asks for my number, but he tugged on me slightly. At this point, the fact that he had tried to get me in the dark, plus his persistence, turn my growing annoyance into fear. I tell him I need the food and he asked me to get in his car in perfect English. Thank the Lord that at this moment, someone in my sister building comes out and makes their way over to the lot. He finally gives me my food and scurries off, which freaked me out. Why after all of that would he speed off at the sight of another person? And how did he just learn English that quick? first he wasn't speaking it clearly but then out of nowhere he spoke it very well clearly his intentions were not good i reported all of this to doordash at the time as well as my local police and social media and it turns out that he's done this to someone before who lives about two miles away from me she had also ordered late night and he apparently asked her if she lived alone and if they could hang out while holding her food hostage DoorDash assured me they deactivated him, but his boldness plus the fact that he seems to only drive late at night makes me think he does this a lot and has probably already assaulted someone. Again, I'm just glad that other person walked out of that building next to ours. I'm a female, age 22. And a few years ago, I used to work at a Chick-fil-A. It was my first ever job, and I lived with my parents in a neighborhood nearby. I would walk to and from work every day because it was only a 15-minute walk, and I didn't have a car. Both of my parents used the only cars that we had, and part of the reason I was working there was to save enough money so that I could buy my own. I was part-time and would work all sorts of hours. Mainly, I would work in the afternoons and nights on weekdays and earlier on the weekends. On one night, probably four months or so after getting the job, I was working pretty late. I think I got off at like 10 p.m. and then I left the restaurant to walk home. This wasn't uncommon at all, and by now the restaurant and the area were pretty quiet. This particular Chick-fil-A was near a few larger stores and a couple of other restaurants. I would take the sidewalk to the residential area less than a mile away and my house was back there. As I left that night and started to walk on the sidewalk, I saw this one guy that was standing out in the Chick-fil-A parking lot. 
Before I had started walking 10 feet, the guy began approaching me. I had never seen him before, and I didn't know what he wanted. I was still wearing my Chick-fil-A clothes, and I had clearly just left the building, so I thought maybe he had a question about Chick-fil-A. I guess that's what I was hoping, because I had a bad feeling. The man walked closer, and then he reached me. I was sort of nervous, but I tried to act calm. When he got to me, he said hi in a friendly tone. The man said that he had noticed that I walked home every day from work and told me that it could be dangerous to walk alone at night. He said that he wanted to walk me home. It seemed pretty weird to me. I told the guy that I was fine and I was capable of getting home by myself. I had walked home by myself countless times, many of them at night. He asked if I was sure and I said yes. The guy seemed disappointed, but then sort of walked away off into the parking lot of a nearby grocery store. Then I started walking home. I kept an eye out and the guy didn't follow me or anything. As I was walking, I realized just how weird of a situation it was. The guy said that he noticed me walking home every night. Had he been watching me? When I did make it home, I looked around to make sure I wasn't followed still. I didn't see anybody. A few days later, I worked another later shift. I got off once again at roughly 10 p.m. This night, I had been working a long time and I wasn't thinking about the guy that I had seen the last time. He wasn't there though. I started walking home on the sidewalk like I always did. When I made it to the end of the sidewalk on the first street, I turned and then started to go into the residential area. The streets were much darker and there were not as many lights around. I walked past an apartment building first and then there were many different other houses. All I had to do was walk to the end of this street, take a left, go two blocks, and then I was home. When I was walking past the apartment building, I thought I heard a noise. I looked over after hearing it. I saw that next to the apartment building, there was a tree, and I thought I saw a guy sort of behind the tree. It was like he was hiding. His head was looking between two large branches. The tree was probably 15 feet away and really obstructed. I could still tell that it was the same guy I had seen a few nights earlier who was hiding behind it though. I looked away immediately and kept walking. When I did, I was really worried that I would hear him walk on the sidewalk behind me. Luckily, I didn't though. I walked as fast as I could back home. When I was back, I told my parents about the situation. They agreed to drive me to and from work after that. Only a few weeks later, I finally had enough money to buy a car, and from then on, I drove to and from work. I never walked to work again, and I never saw the guy again after that either. If I had to guess, I would say that he lived in those apartment buildings. That must have been how he had seen me walking home from work every single night. It really creeps me out that he probably saw me walk home many times without me knowing, especially the way that he was hiding behind the tree watching me. This happened a couple of months ago. It was a weekend afternoon and I was really hungry. I went to the nearby Chick-fil-A, which is one of my favorite restaurants. I was really craving it, but when I got there, I saw that they were very busy. The line in the drive-thru was literally going out of the parking lot, so I decided to park and then walk inside. Sometimes this is faster than the drive-thru in my experiences. But when I got inside, I saw that there was a long line in there too. Lots of people were inside and I got in line at the back. The line started moving up and I was getting closer to ordering, but about a minute after I got there, somebody got in line behind me. When they did, they got uncomfortably close. I felt like they were invading my personal space. I could tell that it was a man and that he was really tall, but I didn't turn around and look at him. When the line moved up, he did too, and he remained a really close distance away from me. He wouldn't move and it was kind of annoying. I didn't want to be rude and tell him to back up, but he was probably less than a foot away from me. I inched closer to the people in front of me. When I did, the guy seemed to move up as well. Within two minutes, probably, it was already my turn to order. I walked up to the register and finally away from the guy. I ordered and then walked over and waited. As I was waiting, I looked around casually. I saw the guy who had been standing so close to me. It had to be him. There was only one really tall guy there. He was standing about 10 feet away from me now. As soon as I looked at him, I saw that he was already looking at me. I then looked away. The guy had kind of big glasses and short hair. Several of us were just standing around waiting for food. When my name was called, I went up, got the food, and then left. All of my frustration from the guy being really close to me and staring at me was now gone. I was just really excited to finally eat. When I walked out the door though, somebody walked out right behind me. 
When I got outside, I noticed who it was. The tall guy that was standing really close to me. He didn't even have any food in his hands. As I walked to my car in the parking lot, the guy walked right behind me. I unlocked my door, and as I was getting inside, I saw the man go to the car right next to mine. That was his car. I started my engine, and he started his. I sat there, waiting for him to back up first, but he didn't. He looked over at me a couple of times, I could tell, but I didn't look over at him. I didn't want to see him. After maybe two or three minutes, both of us just sitting there in our running cars, I turned mine off. I was kind of concerned at this point, and I thought maybe the guy would try to follow me home or something weird. After turning my car off, I opened the door and got out. There was a Target store right by the Chick-fil-A. In fact, their parking lots connected. I figured I could walk in there and maybe lose the guy. I really didn't think he would follow me inside still. But when I started walking to the Target, he got out of his car and started following me. I made it about halfway through the Target parking lot and then looked behind me and saw the guy was still right there. He was maybe 10 feet away. I was frustrated and really tired of this guy. I took a few more normal steps and then turned around and out of nowhere, I sprinted all the way back to my car. I looked behind me to see if the man would sprint as well. He turned around and faced me, but looked confused and did not chase after me. I kept running though. I'm sure if anybody saw me, they thought that I was really weird, but I didn't care. I made it back to my car, started it up, and left. I was able to make it home just fine without being followed. I don't think I have been to that Chick-fil-A ever since. I don't know what that guy's deal was either. How long would he have followed me, and what would he have done? I used to work at a Chick-fil-A. This was about five years ago now. One night, I worked until close. We were pretty busy that night, but by the final hour of work, the restaurant was basically empty. All of the customers were in the drive through We had a couple here and there come inside, but not too many. I had been working, taking customers' orders. When it was just about time to close, I got off the mop to clean the floors. This is something that I often did as we were closing. I would clean the dining area and make sure that any customers knew that we were closing, if there were any. There appeared to be nobody in the dining room as I mopped. But then, as I looked around, I thought I saw a man. We had a play place at our location in the back of the dining room area. It looked as though there was a guy hiding in the play place. There was like a toy car that you could go inside, and it was connected at the top of the slides and other things that kids could play on. I could see the man's head looking out from the car window, then he ducked down. I was not happy to see this. As I mopped the floor, I hoped that the guy would leave, but it was clear that he wasn't planning on it. I decided that I would have to go over and tell the man that he had to get out of here. Adults were not supposed to be in the play place, first of all, and second, we were closing. I walked over and into the play place. I couldn't see the man at all now. When I got to the structure, I called out asking if the guy was okay. I got no answer. I moved back and looked to the window of the toy car again. I saw a man's face briefly appear for just a second. Then he ducked down and out of sight quickly. I said that we were closing now and everybody had to leave. Still nothing. I wasn't quite sure what to do. I decided to go back and tell my two coworkers who were still here what was going on. When I got back to the front counter area and was walking behind it, I heard some noise. I looked and saw a guy running out of the front door of the restaurant. I was glad to see him leave. I really didn't know what he was doing in there. After that, I finished up mopping the floors. Then I left. As I was walking out to my car, I saw the guy again. He was standing near the building on the end. When I looked in his direction, he quickly moved to around the corner. I left after that. I've always wondered what that man was trying to do, hiding inside. Was he planning to rob the place after we closed? That's my best guess. I also don't know why he was still hanging around afterwards. It was very mysterious. When I was in college, I was broke with hella debt from different credit cards, so I decided to start an OnlyFans. I was very reluctant at first, then I just said forget it. I look good enough to make money, so why not? The first day that I was on there, 
I made it free to subscribe to me so I can get followers quick. Then I linked all of my social medias through my IG. My OnlyFans was on there also. My IG was public so anyone could get it. Pause. I logged on and I started a live stream and a few people got on. Then it was just one person. I wore glasses and the guy told me that I was gorgeous and to take my glasses off. So I did. Then he sent me $10. I told him thank you, then a message popped up on the screen. You have nice lips. Can you put on red lipstick, if you have it? I said of course. So I got up and I got my lipstick. I sat down and I put my lipstick on. Then I was sent $25. I told him thank you. Then he asked, if I give you $100, will you do whatever I say for the next 15 minutes? I told him that I don't think that's worth it and I was about to log off. He said, no, 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 not yet. What about 300? I gave the same answer. Then he simply just put 1,000 enough. I sat there and I thought about it. Then I said, yeah, I'll do it. Then I set an alarm for 15 minutes. The first thing he asked me to do was to blow him a kiss and smile. So I did. Then he told me to say that I love Adam. Then I said it. At that point, I was thinking that this was pretty easy. Then he asked me, do I have a red dress? I said, yeah. He then asked me to try it on. So I put the dress on and he called me beautiful. Then the weirdest request popped up. It simply said, cry. I asked him what that means and he said he wants me to cry. So I sat there for a few seconds and I began to try to cry. He typed, nope, none of that fake stuff. I want real tears and emotion. I told him I don't know if I know how to do that. And he said, then no money then. I tried again and no luck. He then put $1,500 in the chat. Well, he typed it. I said, okay. And I walked into my kitchen, opened the refrigerator door, put my hand inside and closed it as hard as I could. I walked back to my laptop and I began to cry. He put good girl in the chat. Then he asked me, do I have scissors? I said, yeah, why? He typed. Cut your hair. I said no, then he typed $2,000 in the chat. I paused for a few seconds and I said okay. I grabbed some scissors, sat back down, and then he typed, nah, use a knife, not scissors. Again, I paused and I said okay. I grabbed a knife, sat down, and began to cut my hair. Then my ponytail was gone. He typed, you look good with short hair. Then he asked me to take my dress off and I said no. Then he typed $2,500 in the chat. Then luckily my alarm went off and I told him that time is up. Then he typed, how about 15 more minutes for $6,000? I said no. Then he asked, do you want these to go public? Then I received 77 photos. I clicked on them. They were from my iCloud. I asked him how he had my photos and he typed, if you don't do what I say for 15 more minutes, everyone that you know will see these photos. I told him, yeah, right, and I closed my laptop. And no lie, a few minutes later, I received over 50 text messages from family and friends that they saw my photos. My landlord told me not to worry about the rent and that he didn't know I was working with a dump truck back there and that I was thicker than a bowl of oatmeal. I don't even know what that means. And after that, Honestly, I never went back on the OnlyFans. I went and got a real job, something safer. I became a stripper. But anyways, I changed my whole iCloud and everything. But that was the weirdest night of my life. It all started with the Zoom call. At least, I only became aware it was happening because of a Zoom call. For all I know, it could have been happening for much longer, but the day of the second post-lockdown work meeting was the first time I noticed it. We're in the middle of a pretty tedious brainstorming session with a few members of marketing when a coworker interrupts whoever's talking to address me by name. It actually made me jump at first. I was totally tuned out, so hearing my name brought me right back around again. I respond, huh? Uh, yep, I was listening. When I notice the person who addressed me is now closely studying their own laptop screen. I don't mean to alarm you, 
they said. But I think someone's watching you through the window behind you. I know exactly which window he's talking about, so I turn, a bit nervous at the idea of discovering he's right, only to see that there's no one there. I'm more relieved than anything, to be honest. I figured he was playing a joke on me because he clocked that I was nodding off during the meeting, and I'd be lying if I said I didn't maybe deserve it a little bit. <laughs> Very funny, I said, and a few of the other callers had a little titter at the impromptu prank. I'm sorry, but I wasn't joking, the guy said. Did no one else see that? I'm so sure. Eh, hey, you're probably just seeing things. Someone else chimed in, and within a few minutes, the whole thing was completely forgotten. A smudge on the screen, a bit of lag on the call, eyes playing tricks. There were a hundred ways to explain it. The truth was literally unthinkable at that stage. A short while later, the exact same thing happens. The same guy interrupts, only far more urgently this time, saying, Look, look, it's right there. I'm not imagining it. You can all see that, yeah? I know what he's talking about, only I don't turn around immediately. I look at my own webcam feed to see what he was talking about, and right when I see it, what's clearly the silhouette of a head in the window behind me, I hear one of the other callers say like, Oh, wow, I see it too. I spin around just in time to catch the quick blur of whoever was watching me, ducking out of view. I'm actually really creeped out at this point because it obviously wasn't just somebody walking past my ground floor bedroom. Someone had actually stopped to stare inside. My window isn't even facing the street. It's at the side of the apartment block like you have to actually go out of your way to find it. Now I'm only 5'3 and I'm 8 stone which for any Americans reading this means I'm tiny. And I had to make sure if someone was actually creeping on me they weren't just hiding out and waiting until I was vulnerable. So, phone in one hand, kitchen knife in the other, I tell the Zoom call that I'll be right back and then head out to make sure that everything is kosher. It's peak lockdown during all of this, so the streets are pretty much deserted, so I think I'd have noticed anyone wandering around. But there was no one, not a soul in sight. So I guessed, or rather hoped, that it was just some neighbor kids messing around, maybe looking for a wayward ball or something. About a week goes by and the whole window face incident has been at the back of my mind the whole time. For a lot of young women who live alone, the idea of being targeted where we're most vulnerable is frankly terrifying. So the prospect of that nightmare coming to life just didn't bear thinking about. I'm not saying I was on edge the whole time or that I lose sleep over it or anything, but let's just say I held my keys a little tighter in my fists whenever I walk down the street my apartment block is on. But anyway, at one point I head out to the grocery store to pick up food and I end up caught in one of those super long COVID lines that you're stuck in for like 40 minutes before you're allowed into the store to buy your stuff. This is on top of the fact that the store near me had implemented this dumb one-way system in the aisles in an attempt to stop the spread. My point is, a trip that would have normally taken like half hour ends up taking more like 90 minutes and an annoying amount of my day has been completely wasted. So, I'm already in a bad mood by the time I get back to my apartment, only to find that the front door has been bashed in. Apparently, there had been a break-in while I was out. If only criminals could work from home. It seemed obvious that it was a burglary at first. All my stuff had been strewn around, drawers and cabinets were opened and emptied. The TV was still there, along with my PlayStation, but... Most break-ins just go for jewelry and phones I heard, anything small that they can pawn easily. Obviously, I call the cops like there and then, who arrive within a half hour or so. They advise me to help them look around the apartment for anything that might be missing, valuable electronics and whatnot, but I told them I already looked and that nothing obvious seemed to have been taken. My bedroom looked like it had been hit by a bomb. Clothes had been strewn all over the place. Whole drawers had been pulled out and flipped, like whoever broke in was looking for something. One of the cops spent some time looking around in there before he called out to his partner. Hey, we need forensics up in here is what he actually said. I asked him what the deal was, if he'd found something that I should know about. 
Both cops had been warm, friendly, and helpful up until that point. But when I asked him why forensics was needed, one of them told me not to worry about it and to stay out of my bedroom for the time being. It was no big deal at first. I was just grateful that they showed up so fast. Even if they did wear masks and insist on keeping six feet between us at all times, so by the time forensics team showed up, I'm out front of my apartment building talking to my mom on the phone. Only when I see what they're actually doing in my apartment, it triggers what I can only describe as a mini freakout. Guys in gloves and white coverall suits have been scooping big handfuls of my underwear into bags, sealing them, then taking them out to the truck outside. And then it dawns on me, whoever broke into my apartment had left DNA on my underwear. Now, I probably don't need to tell you how exactly they done that. The whole thing grosses me out too much for me to actually type it. But the thing that really got to me was, if I'd actually been home that afternoon, there's no telling what would have happened if some violent perv had actually gotten their dirty hands on me. But anyway, the story does actually have something of a resolution and thankfully a happy ending, because... They had this guy's DNA. Police were able to match it on their database with a guy who'd had multiple run-ins with the law for public exposure, among other things. He was arrested, and he's now looking at three years in prison for aggravated burglary, some kind of charge like that. But the whole thing came full circle for me in an interview with some detective, who'd mentioned that this guy liked casing his victim's places before he struck. Over the past month or so, have you seen anyone hanging around your apartment who doesn't live there? Maybe someone looking through your window. He said it. He literally said it. It was him that day when I was in the Zoom call. It was him that had been looking through my window. He'd been stalking me for God knows how long, and when it came for him to actually get me, only by the grace of God was I lucky enough to have been out grocery shopping. Otherwise, it doesn't bear thinking about what might have happened. I worked at a gas station in my small North Carolinian town 10 miles from Charlotte. I was a 39-year-old wife and a mother of three daughters. I was a stay-at-home mom and my daughters were all in school, and at the time, my family really needed a little extra income. The area was predominantly safe. My hours were 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. My duties were being a cashier, of course, stocking products, cleaning, doing nightly audits, and reading every Dean Koontz novel I could get my hands on. All of this by myself, I should add. The company didn't feel a need for a second person on this shift because it was really slow, but on weekends, very hectic. I handled this job like a pro. I really loved seeing my regulars at night and the morning workers getting their coffee and heading to work. I was at this gas station, which was also a bit of a convenience store, for about a year. I did have the run-of-the-mill meth heads who liked their sweets. The home was looking for freebie 6 or somewhere to charge their phone. I also had the occasional local police officers that would come in at around 12 to 1 a.m. for free coffee and bitch about their shift. On this particular night, I was reading the Dean Koontz novel Intensity. I put the bookmark in because I felt like moving around. I went around the counter to the 5-hour energy shots and I began to organize and stock. I heard the bell above the door like I had a million times before. I had so many regulars, ranging from pizza delivery guys to EMTs. I was setting the case of five-hour energy shots down to help this customer when I felt something cold and hard against my right shoulder blade. My first instinct was that this was a cruel prank from a regular. I turned around to say so when I was then met with a gun pointing at my forehead. It was an African-American guy with a bandana on half of his face. I immediately put my hands up in shock. I looked around and I saw that there were three more guys in different colored bandanas with no gun but looking nervous and then demanding me to give all the money. I walked around the counter with this guy holding his gun right to my head and telling me, 
Hurry up. Give me the money. Open the register. I said with my hand still in the air and shaking. Yes, yes, of course. Here. And I opened up the register for him. The other four guys descended on this register, getting all the cash in the register. Suddenly, the gunman looked at me, then said, This register too, bitch. There was a second register that had the bare minimum for the first shift to open up with. I put in my code, and I opened that register as well. They cleaned out that one too. They then saw the safe underneath the first register, and again, the gunman pointed his gun to my temple, and also demanded I open the safe. I said in a shaky voice that the safe is on a timer. If you press one button, whether it be for the $10 bills or a roll of quarters, it won't dispense again for a whole two minutes. The guys were all on the safe pressing buttons, while in the meantime, I'm praying out loud for God to spare me, because I have a husband and children that need me. I kept frantically saying this prayer, and the guys were all frustrated that the safe wasn't giving them what they wanted. I heard one of the guys saying, One of you shut that bitch up! And another said, Just shoot her already! We already have what we need! Right at that statement, I could literally feel I was about to lose my bladder and pee all over myself. Even though I was scared out of my mind, I was also mad as hell that this was possibly going to be where I ended up. I held in that pee, and I just watched as they started to steal as many cigarettes, wraps, and black and miles as they could. One of the guys then yelled, We've been here too long. Let's go. Let's get the hell out of here. Three of them were sprinting out the door, while one was in front of me, all while I was shaking with clenched hands praying. I looked up, and then his bandana fell down. I thought this was it for me, but he then just smiled at me, and he joined his friends. At the very same time, a woman came inside to buy a soda. They yelled at her too, pointing the gun at her to give them her purse. The lady replied back with, I'm not giving you my purse, motherfucker, and I thought for sure they would get aggressive. Instead, however, they seemed to just be worried about being there too long. They then ran out the door and scattered through the parking lot. I looked at the lady, then the glass door, and I could see her partner's truck sitting outside. I told her to go to her truck while I called the police. I then locked the door as soon as she was in the truck. I picked up the store's landline and I dialed 911. I ran to the stockroom and I locked that door as well. I told the 911 operator of all the details she needed and after only a couple of minutes, she said it was safe to go to the front door for the officers. And I did just that. I unlocked the door, and I immediately removed my name tag and threw it in the trash. I felt like this was finally over, and I was obviously quitting. I saw the woman customer that was confronted by the gunman just shaking, and she was rocking back and forth. I put my hand on her shoulder, as she also gave her own statement to the police. I gave the officers my statement, and I called my manager. She came to the store along with CSI investigators. I had to watch myself on tape at least three times with the investigators. At one point, a CSI guy paused the video while the thieves were surrounding the safe and their back was turned, and he asked me, Ma'am, why didn't you run? Because I was afraid I'd be shot in the back, I said. The man apologized immediately, realizing how traumatized I really was. After the police left, I continued to converse with my manager as she tried to console me. She then called her manager because she had never been through anything like this. I actually heard upper management tell her, Oh, she'll be alright. No need for me to get out of bed for this. I literally lost it and I told her she was a piece of shit. I eventually went home, and around this time it's four in the morning. I race upstairs, and I kiss all my children on their foreheads. I then went to mine and my husband's bedroom, and I went into our bathroom to wash my face. I was thinking in my head that I didn't want to wake him up, because he has another hour to sleep before shift for his job begins. 
I couldn't help but to break down after realizing I was alive and that I was now at home splashing water on my face. My husband woke up to this and he asked in a slight panic, What's wrong, babe? What's going on? I broke down to my knees on my bathroom floor and I then explained my entire nightmare night to him. He held me and consoled me. I stayed up until it was time to take my children to school. When I got back home, I called the company's HR. They were very cold towards me. I then decided to call a workers' compensation lawyer. After discussing what happened to me on my third shift all by myself, as well as the HR being so cold towards me, he took my case. I discovered that the four guys that robbed me at gunpoint were all 16 years old. I don't know what punishment they ever received, but I do know that I got one year of unemployment checks, as well as a settlement of $25,000. I also received therapy for the PTSD that I now have. It took about a year for me to be able to go to a gas station all on my own. It's been about four years since, and I'm doing okay now. That is, as long as I have my two knives and a taser with me. Back in the summer of 2020, I was at home playing video games with a buddy of mine when I realized I didn't have any booze left. Pretty much all I did during the pandemic was drink and play video games. Please don't judge me. Anyway, I decided to drive to the local gas station just a few minutes away from my house. As I walked into the gas station, I had noticed four men, four very large men and they were being very loud and obnoxious by the gas pumps. They must have been pretty drunk too, because they were being so rowdy, and two of them seemed to be stumbling around their truck. Now, this wasn't an abnormal sight, as my town's full of rednecks who drink way too much. Anyway, I went into the gas station, and I went over to the liquor section, and I had grabbed my choice of beverage. As I was grabbing my drink, The men had come in to pay for their gas, or whatever they were buying. The cashier was a young, attractive girl. She must have also been new because I frequented that gas station a lot, and I had never seen her there before. As the men were paying for their things, they had started to say very sexual things to the girl. I could tell it was making her uncomfortable. I won't repeat them, as they're just really not worth saying but they began asking her what time she got off and which car was hers. I could see that she was starting to shake and she could barely get the change out of the register. I really felt terrible for her and I then shouted, Hey, just pay for your things and leave. Now my mouth had acted before my brain could process that these men had not only outnumbered me, but they were almost twice my size. I'm a male, and I'm about six feet tall and decently built, but if these men decided not to play nice with me, I stood no chance at all. After I blurted out for them to leave, they all turned and looked at me. It was then that I realized the situation that I had just put myself in, and my heart dropped into my stomach. By the pure grace of God, they simply shot a pissed off glance at me, nodded, and then left. I then approached the counter, asking the young girl if she was okay. She was still shaking, but she said yes. I asked her if she wanted me to call the police for her, but she said no, and that her manager was in the back. I just said okay, and I paid for my things. I looked out the window, and luckily the big rusty truck the men came from was now gone. I did a quick jog to my car, making sure they weren't parked around the corner of the building and they weren't. I was able to make it home to enjoy some drunken video games with my friends. So fellas, if you are ever in the position to stop sexual harassment, do it. Just make sure you aren't possibly going to get your ass kicked in the process. Lately, I have been rethinking my career choice. I currently work as a location manager in the city where I live. For those people who may not specifically know what I mean when I say location manager, it just means that I'm responsible for finding locations for directors to film and secure locations for film production. 
I know it may not seem like a glorious job, but this industry is crazy, and I had to secure any job that I could get. I love movies and the entire entertainment industry, and it has always been a dream to work in this field one way or another. Well, as it turns out, I was quite good at being a location manager. Over time, I was able to build up a little bit of credibility, which made it much easier to secure locations. I worked on a bunch of films for the last several years, some bigger than others, but mostly low-budget films. During my time doing this, I met a ton of famous actors and influential people in the industry. At this point, you're probably wondering why I would be rethinking my career choice. Everything seems super cool. The simple answer is, this world of film and entertainment burns you out quicker than anything else. However, that is not the main reason why I've been truly rethinking my career. In actuality, the straw that broke the camel's back is much darker and more sinister. The last movie I worked on was not a great movie, plain and simple. Everybody is entitled to their opinions, of course, but objectively speaking, this was one of those ultra-sappy movies that you find on the Hallmark channel and it just felt uninspired. I will say, though, that the crew on this production was amazing. I love the writers and directors and even some of the actors. We ended up getting to know each other and going out on a couple of occasions. The beauty of working on these smaller productions is that you really get to form a bond with a lot of the crew, which is something I imagine doesn't happen on massive Hollywood film sets. One of the extras in the film, who had a handful of lines, started to hang out with me quite a bit. Her name was Hannah, and like a lot of extras, she was, and I believe still is, an inspiring actress. Hannah is someone that I would describe as remarkably beautiful. When she walked into a room, heads would turn, and that's not even an exaggeration. When the director met her, he was so blown away that he gave her a very minor part in the movie. She literally had like five lines, but I assume that's sort of a big deal for your first movie. In the several weeks that we worked on the movie, Hannah seemed to take a liking to me, which, at first, I was really into. After Hannah's small part, she stuck around with me and helped me. She basically was an unofficial assistant to me and helped me with day-to-day -day tasks, and I made sure that I was able to get her paid for her efforts. Like any production, towards the end of shooting, tensions can get a bit high and people can get short with you. However, what happened on our last day of production was something altogether different. Often on film sets, filming can take place overnight, and that was the case for this final day of production. Hannah was on location with me just helping, but she didn't seem like herself. Hannah was always upbeat and excited, but tonight she was in another world. She was quiet, dismissive, and kind of rude for lack of a better word. I'm not sure exactly what time it was, but it was sometime in the middle of the night. We had a small crew of art department guys setting up the location. I was there basically just overseeing everything and Hannah was there just helping me. The director and the actors for the scene were there, but they were all resting in the back room in the building while we were filming inside. When the art guys finished, they all headed out and it got to be just myself and Hannah awake in this location. In all the years I've worked on movies, I had never seen such a light crew. You could tell the feelings and vibes of this project just weren't all there. I tried making conversation with Hannah and joking around with her, but all my efforts sort of just failed. She just kept brushing me off and I honestly didn't really care. I figured once we wrapped the film up, I would never see her again. While I was awkwardly just walking around the set, I heard Hannah shout for me and it sounded like it was coming from a distance. Seconds ago, she was right next to me, so I found it weird that she was in the next room. I rushed in there to make sure that she was okay and when I got in there, she was standing in the back of the room with the lights off. I could only barely see her. The only lights were the lights shining into the room from the doorway I was now standing in. Anna? Are you alright? What's going on? I said with genuine concern. She just smiled at me and said in an almost seductive voice, and yet it still sounded off. She said, Hi. I have something for you. Well, as you may expect, my mind was racing. I had a feeling that maybe this girl had an interest in me, and... Now she wanted me to join her in this room alone. I slowly approached her because I was still feeling some apprehension about all of this for some reason. When I got about five feet away from her, I noticed her hand behind her back. I stopped and asked, What do you got behind your back? You're not going to stab me, are you? I laughed, trying to make light of the strange situation. At that moment, Anna started to cry and sob uncontrollably. I didn't know what I did to upset her. Before I could say anything, she shouted, 
I liked you so much, and all you ever cared about was a stupid movie. I hate you. As I tried to take all of that in, she threw a knife from behind her back onto the ground and ran right through me and knocked me off my feet. My heart was beating out of my chest at this point, and when I approached the wall where I was standing, I looked down and it was in fact a knife. A real knife. For some reason I never reported this to the director or the authorities. I have no idea why, I just figured since nothing happened I'm better off just leaving it alone. The more time that passes, the more I think about that night. What would have happened if I kept walking toward her? Would she have stabbed me or was it all just a trick? If it wasn't the middle of the night, would she have even tried anything like this and perhaps most horrifying, I have no idea where she is or where she went. She's got no social media anymore, I looked and no other film credits, at least that I could find. This industry is crazy, man. You meet a lot of strange people who sometimes just aren't all there. Hannah, for example, is a sweet, beautiful girl, and one night, I don't know if it was the sleep deprivation or all the hours we were working, but she just lost it. I think the highs and lows of this industry have always taken enough toll on me. As I've stated, I assume she's probably still trying to act, probably under another name, but honestly, this poor girl has some inner demons, and it wouldn't surprise me one bit if the demons in her head won. In my mid-twenties, I was trying to figure out a lot of aspects of my life, and I was trying to get my future in order. I was never objectively a bad person, but somehow, I always seemed to fall through the cracks. I finished near the bottom of my class with my GPA, never went to college, and experimented with some extracurricular things that you could say are illegal. I was never in trouble, but I also never brought anything of substance to the table. I was about a month away from my 26th birthday when I met Janelle, and that's when I decided it was time to use my brain and become a decent member of society instead of a burnout. Due to my disturbing resume or lack thereof at this point in my life, I was finding it very hard to find a job. Even jobs that you may think anybody can get, I wouldn't even get a call back. Even if I went out of my way to reach back out to them to follow up on applications, I still would never have my call returned. It hit me hard. Just as I was about to give up, like I always did, Janelle found me an amazing job. Not glamorous by any means, but for someone like me it was amazing. The job was for an overnight warehouse worker. I would work from 9pm until 6.30am loading up pallets with boxes. Though the main premise sounds simple enough, and it was... Physically, the job was tough. We never had enough help, and it was extremely hard to keep help once we would get workers in the door. I found myself a lot of time working alone until finally the company downsized. We started to work until 4.30 in the morning instead of 6.30, and the little help that we had was spread thin. When I was working, I would put headphones on and just get into the zone. I didn't bother talking to anybody or even getting to know anyone because chances are I wouldn't be seeing them in a week or two and honestly, talking just distracted me and I was all about getting my job done. One night when I was nearing the end of my shift, I noticed a small looking man standing about 5 feet away from me. I didn't say anything at first because I figured it was a new employee just watching how I was doing things. When I finished, I took my headphones and asked the guy if he needed anything and he responded, Yeah man, I hate to ask but... I was wondering if I could get a ride home. I found it weird considering I had no idea who this guy was and didn't even recognize his face as one of the workers. Being the kind of guy that I am, I told him that I would for some gas money. He responded almost nervously and said, Yeah, yeah, man, of course, I, I got you. I told the guy to give me a few minutes to grab my things and punch out of my shift and to meet me outside. He nodded and agreed. I felt weird about the situation, but I'd been in his shoes before, I kept telling myself. I told one of the other guys when I was punching out that I had to give the weird new guy a ride home, and the other employees made a strange face and asked, The new guy? I don't remember seeing a new guy. We both shrugged it off, just assuming that's how this place operates these days. I went outside a few minutes later and saw the strange guy waiting next to my car. What I didn't find alarming then, and I wish I would have, was that I'd never told the guy which car I drove, and yet he was already waiting by my car. We started to drive, and right away things were getting weird. 
I asked him where he lived and he gave me some vague and confusing answer. Uh, I live on Maple Drive. Well, well, no, not, not anymore. I, I live, uh, near the park. You know, Rose Park by the edge of the city? I nodded and said, Okay, man, near the park. Where near the park? I just, just want to know where I'm dropping you off, dude. The man said nothing for a few seconds and then said, Just near the park. Head towards the park and I'll tell you where to go. I'm still kind of in awe of my stupidity as I write this. You have to understand at this point in my life I really didn't care about much and just wanted to get from point A to point B in my day-to-day -day life. I didn't question really anything. When we got close to the park, the man finally spoke up. Turn here. I stopped the car for a moment and said to the guy, Are you sure? This doesn't really look like a street. The man just kept saying, y Yeah, in his shaky voice as he nodded intently. Against my better judgment, I turned down the long, dark path. This was for sure not a road. It was a dirt path and I couldn't see anything. I turned on my high beams and thankfully it was just in time. Obstructing the road in front of me was a massive fallen tree. Oh, dude. Ugh. Ugh. Looks like we're going to have to go another way or something. I'm not getting by this tree. The man didn't say anything. I looked over at him and he had his hands in his hoodie. While I was looking at him, he said, Get out of the car now. He kept moving his hands inside his sweatshirt as if though he was trying to grab something he had concealed underneath. When I looked up out of the windshield, I saw two more masked men coming from the side of the fallen tree. My heart was racing out of my chest at this point. I didn't know if I was going to get robbed or worse. The man in my car then screamed at the top of his lungs and said, Get out now! I slowly started to open my car door and noticed another two men behind my car also wearing masks. When my door was open, I started to step out, and I noticed the man in my car start to get out of my vehicle as well, and that's when I made the single most daring decision of my life. As I noticed him clearly outside of the car, I jumped back into the driver's seat and reversed as fast as I could. Thankfully, he never ordered me to shut the car off, so the car was running this entire time. I may have bumped into one of the potential robbers, or maybe it was a big tree branch I wasn't sure in the heat of the moment. When I got to the end of the dark path and was putting my car into drive so I could peel off, I looked back one last time and I saw all five men sprinting directly at my car. They all appeared to be holding something in their hands, but I didn't bother to find out what they were carrying. I used to work the register at a local gas station, though I've since left as there were a lot of strange things that happened when I would work overnight. But this one situation in particular will stick with me forever. I only worked the night shift a few days a week, usually Friday and Saturday. My shifts were usually boring and honestly just a game of trying to stay awake. The only thing I really had to do was stock the shelves and occasionally help a customer. I would get a lot of drunk people or families on road trips and sometimes even whole groups of friends but for the most part, it was pretty quiet. On this night, it was around 2 a.m., and I hadn't had a customer in over an hour, so I was starting to doze off a little bit. The desk was around the corner from the entrance, and there was a bell on the door that rang when somebody walked in, so usually falling asleep wasn't too big of a deal. I woke up after a few minutes, hearing the bell ring, and a few seconds later saw a customer walk in. He looked like a typical 30-year-old man that would come in for some beer or a snack. He walked around for a little bit, down every aisle, looking at everything. Now, I've worked in retail for a long time, and I know what it looks like when someone is looking for something specific. But this man had nothing in mind. He was just looking at the shelves, browsing the store. During the day, this is pretty normal but people don't usually come in at 2 a.m. to browse the gas station shelves. I looked out the window to my left to see if he was filling up his car and was maybe just passing the time, but there were no cars outside. A couple minutes went by before he eventually looked over at me and said thanks and then walked out. I didn't know what to make of that, but I just figured he stole something small and was just being a dick about it. 
The whole situation left my mind after a few minutes, and I started to get really tired again. This time, I decided to grab my cart of items to stock, and start filling up the shelves to pass the time. I'm not really sure how long I was stocking for, maybe 20 minutes, before I saw a man show up at the end of the aisle I was stocking. It made me jump a little, as I never heard the door ring. This guy was wearing a large hoodie and dark clothes. I pretty much knew right away that something was very off. The man continued down to the back of the store, and I immediately went back to behind the counter. I tried not to stare, but I noticed that as he walked down the aisles, he wasn't looking for anything. He was just browsing. It clicked in my head immediately that this was the same guy from just a little bit ago, but he had changed clothes for some reason. I also came to the realization that he probably came initially to scope out the place before doing whatever he planned on doing. I started to panic in my head. The man began to come down the aisle closest to the counter, and I could see something heavy in his front hoodie pocket. I made a split second decision to try and prevent any further escalation, and I said, Welcome back, sir. Need help finding anything? He made eye contact with me, and I could tell he knew exactly what I was trying to do. He approached the counter, not saying a word, and brought his hand out of his pocket, revealing a small handgun. Then he grabbed a small pack of gum from beside the counter and placed it in front of me. He said just this. Confused and in shock as to what was happening, I didn't even react for a few seconds before eventually scanning the gum nervously. Still holding the gun, he took out a dollar from his jean pocket and threw it on the counter, then said thanks and walked out. I was in total shock, trying to wrap my head around what just happened. I ended up reporting the situation to the police and calling my manager, who didn't pick up. No updates ever came out of the situation, but it had me on edge for the last few months that I worked there. I'm still unsure of what really happened that night, or what the man's intentions were, but honestly, I'm glad I never found out. I was walking home from the mall on Valentine's Day, feeling pretty good about my day of shopping and indulging in some much needed me time. The sun was starting to set and the sky was a beautiful shade of pink and orange, so I decided to take the long way home to enjoy the peacefulness of the quiet streets and the beauty of the sky above me. I was 25 and excited to be starting a new job at the coffee shop next to my apartment. I had finally moved out of my parents' house and was beginning to feel like my life was going in the direction I wanted it to. I was listening to music through my earbuds, but had this nerve-wracking feeling that something was just off. It's like I could feel someone watching me. Almost like an invisible set of eyes were just locked directly to my every move. My heart began to race and my breathing became shallow as I quickened my pace and I was desperate just to get home. I looked over my shoulder and, of course, there he was. My ex. The one who couldn't get over me and just wouldn't leave me alone. After we broke up almost a year before this, he did everything he could to convince me to take him back. At first, it was normal stuff like having flowers sent to my home or mailing me sweet letters in the mail. It was romantic and nice and kind of innocent even, but I didn't want to get back together with him so I never responded to any of it. At this point, I hadn't seen or heard from him for a couple of months and I thought that he had finally gotten the hint that it was over between us but apparently not. He was walking about ten feet behind me, and when I looked back at him, I could see this sort of sinister look in his eyes. He had always been a bit creepy, but this was some next-level stuff. He didn't say a word. He just sort of smiled this horribly disturbing smile. I tried to ignore him and keep walking, but he started following me more closely, getting closer and closer with each step. I turned a corner, hoping to lose him, but he was still there. And every step that I took, he took the same one only five feet behind me. I started to feel my panic set in. I'd always felt safe walking home alone, but now I felt like I was being hunted or stalked like someone's prey. 
I pulled out my phone, calling a friend, but she didn't answer. I tried calling my roommate, but still no answer. I was completely alone with no one to help me. I had called the police on him many times before, and the last time they just straight up told me not to call again about him unless it was a life or death situation, and I really didn't want to hear about that again. So I started to run, hoping to get to my apartment building before he caught up with me. I could hear him getting closer and closer with every step, and so close that I could even hear his heavy breathing. I was gasping for air and my heart was pounding in my chest, but I knew that I had to keep running. I finally made it to my building and ran inside, but he caught the door and followed me in. I could hear his footsteps echoing down the hall as I ran to my apartment and locked the door behind me once I was safely inside. I was okay. I wanted to scream and cry at the same time, but it wasn't over yet. I tried to calm myself down, but my mind was just racing. I didn't know what to do. I didn't want to call the police. I didn't want to make a scene and I didn't want to draw attention to myself. I just wanted it all to be over. I wanted my ex to be one of those guys that just moves on when a relationship ends. My roommate found me curled up in a ball in front of the door and asked me what happened. Through tears and hyperventilation, I told her everything. She was horrified and told me that she didn't care what they said the last time that I had called and that she was calling the police, because being chased home by your psycho stalker ex is in fact life or death. Just as she got a hold of the dispatcher, we heard a noise outside the door. I froze, my heart racing. My roommate and I stared at each other with wide eyes, waiting, listening for any noise coming from outside my door. Was he trying to get inside? I grabbed a knife from the kitchen just in case. The noise stopped and I started to relax a little. My roommate was explaining everything to the dispatcher when suddenly it started again. This time it was louder. It was a loud banging noise, but the banging wasn't coming from the door. It was almost like he was stomping around outside the door having a tantrum that he wasn't able to get inside. I'd never experienced that side of him and I never knew that he was capable of doing something like this. Throughout our whole relationship he seemed so normal. The reason we broke up was because he had cheated and I felt like if he was willing to risk our whole relationship for one night with a random woman then our relationship didn't mean much to him to begin with. You'd think that he would have been able to move on by the time this all happened. I crept up to the door, knife in hand, and peered through the peephole. I couldn't see anyone, but I could hear someone breathing. It sounded like his mouth was pressed against the door like he wanted to hear it. I started to panic again, but my roommate tried her best to calm me down. The police told us to stay inside and keep the door locked until they arrived. They said it would only take around ten minutes for them to get there. We sat on the floor and waited for the police. All the while I could hear him still breathing on the other side of the door and I knew that all he wanted was to get inside and do God knows what to me. Finally, the police got there and they arrested my ex. He didn't put up a fight and went with them willingly. They took him away and I was finally able to sort of breathe a sigh of relief but unfortunately the sort of fear and panic would stay with me for quite a long time. No matter how much I wanted to or how convenient it would be, I could never get myself to walk home alone again. I never forgot the feeling of being followed and hunted by someone who had supposedly loved me before. I was lucky to make it out alive, but the thought of what could have happened is something I still think about almost every day. I never thought that someone I once loved could turn into a monster. It's important to always trust your instincts. I learned that the hard way and I hope that my story can serve as a warning to others it serves as a reminder that sometimes love can just turn into an obsession, and that obsession can turn into something much more dangerous. I was so excited to start a new life in the city. My girlfriend and I had just moved into a small apartment, and I was eager to explore a place that I'd never been before. I had gone to the grocery store to pick up a few things, and as I was walking home, I was texting my girlfriend about all the cool things I came across on the walk, and all the fun stuff that there was for us to do together around the city. I was so preoccupied with my phone that I didn't even realize that I'd gotten turned around. I don't know how I was stupid enough to not look where I was going, but I was just really excited to tell her about my day and everything I saw. After a while, I finally looked up and realized that I had no idea where I was. The streets were empty and the buildings appeared to look abandoned with their doors and windows boarded up. 
It kind of looked like something out of an apocalyptic video game, The Last of Us. I was starting to feel uneasy and honestly a little scared. This looked like nothing of the area that I was just walking in not too long ago. I looked at my phone's map and started making my way back in the right direction. I was around four miles from home still and it was getting dark. As I was walking I saw an old car with a taxi sign on top. It was starting to rain and the darkness was engulfing the streets around me, but I still hesitated for a second before getting in. It didn't look like an official taxi and I'd seen way too many true crime shows to trust it, but I just wanted to get home and the thought of being lost in this unfamiliar place was freaking me out way more than getting in the car. I knocked on the window and the driver rolled it down just a little crack and it was enough for me to ask if he was able to take me where I needed to go. He didn't speak, just nodded a yes in my direction. He unlocked the doors and I got in and told him to drop me off at the gas station near my apartment building and I gave him the address. The driver started the engine and we were off. I still had my maps app open and glanced at it every so often to make sure that we were going in the right direction. Only the further we drove... I noticed that we had started going in the opposite direction of my apartment. I started to get nervous and asked the driver if he could take me home or even just let me out so I could find another ride but he didn't say a word, instead just kept driving. I started to feel panic set in as the car took me further away from my home. I demanded that the driver let me out and he just sort of chuckled to himself. I tried to open the door but it was locked and didn't have a button to unlock it. It was one of those locks where when the car is locked it retracts into the door and you can't pull it up to unlock it. And I was trapped. I started to feel a cold sweat on my skin as the fear that I was feeling began to fill every inch of my body. The driver drove for what felt like forever, taking me deeper into the outskirts of the city down its darkest, deserted streets. In reality, we probably only drove for around 30 minutes, but the panic and fear that I was feeling in that car made every second feel like hours. The rain was coming down harder and harder, and I could feel the driver's eyes on me through the rearview mirror. He was watching me closely, and it was making me even more afraid. I was trapped in that taxi with a stranger who seemed to have no intention of letting me go. The fear and desperation was overwhelming, and no matter how hard I tried, I couldn't think of a way out. Eventually, the taxi pulled off to the side of the road and the driver turned to look at me. He was wearing a black hoodie and his face was littered with the trashiest tattoos I'd ever seen. I almost wanted to laugh for a second and remembered where I was and decided that that wouldn't be the best idea. I could see a sort of creepy smirk on his face as he spoke to me in a harsh voice. Welcome to your final destination, he said, and I felt a chill run down my spine. I didn't know what to do. I tried to reason with the driver to just let me go and there'd be no harm done, but he wouldn't listen. He just laughed as he got out of the car and walked towards the back door. I didn't even know what to think. I had no idea what he was going to do with me. The driver opened the back door and dragged me out of the car by my jacket. He threw me into the gutter and I hit the ground hard. I was in pain, but I was still alive. I tried to get up and run, but he was fast and caught me, tackling me to the ground. He put a knife to my throat and I was on the verge of tears and I tried to scream but nothing came out. Why are you doing this? I asked, my voice shaking, and the driver just laughed saying, why not? I was terrified and I couldn't move. I could feel the cold metal of the knife against my skin. Finally I was able to muster up a scream loud enough that somehow a group of people nearby were able to hear it. I heard footsteps coming from down the street and thank God that they were getting closer. The man told me to shut up and press the knife harder against my skin, and just when I thought things were over for me, I heard a voice calling out in the distance. Hey, what's going on here? I looked down the street and only about 50 feet away, a group of people were walking towards us. They were watching us and I realized that the driver was beginning to get nervous. His hands began to shake and he got off of me as fast as he could. He turned and ran away on foot just leaving his car and me laying there on the street, reeling from what had just happened. The group ran towards me and one of the guys helped me up and put pressure on the wound that I didn't even notice that I had on my neck. They called the police and an ambulance took me to the hospital. I needed a few stitches for the laceration of my throat but was otherwise physically okay. 
The police searched the vehicle and realized that it was stolen and there was nothing in it to tie it to the person who had done that to me that night. Now years later, another man was abducted in the same manner in that area, only this time the man was caught and he was arrested. I was called in due to the correlation in the crime and was able to identify the man as the man who attacked me on that night and thank God that he was charged and sentenced to seven years in prison. He never admitted to kidnapping anyone else, but we knew that that was probably not true. I tried my best to get over it, but the emotional scars will always be there, along with the physical one on my neck. I'm so grateful to the people who saved me. I'll never forget the fear and desperation that I felt in that taxi, but I'll also never forget the kindness and bravery of the strangers who risked their lives to help me and make sure that I was okay. From that day on, I made sure to always pay attention to my surroundings and never let my guard down again. It was back in the summer of 1974, and I was 16 years old at the time. I had just attended a concert in the city with my friends Dave and John. The three of us were catching a train home. We had got off at our stop, and we began walking home down the main road chatting about the concert and still buzzing from the cool vibes. It was around 12 a.m. and we were crossing at a main intersection. There wasn't much traffic around this time of night, and as we crossed the road, we suddenly noticed a beat-up brown-colored station wagon stop in the middle of the intersection right near us. His window was down and the driver was around 25 to 30 years old, and although he looked a little dodgy, we just assumed he was going to ask for directions and so we just stood there waiting to see what this guy wanted, completely unaware of the sheer terror that was about to follow. In that very moment, the guy pulled out a pistol from his lap, and what he uttered next still gives me shivers to this day. He said in a calm tone, Who wants it first? We just froze in absolute shock and terror, and it took a few seconds for all the reality of this to finally sink in. We didn't even have time to exchange a look, and we all hightailed it across the intersection. As our footsteps thundered across the road, the sound of gunshots filled the air as we ran for those bushes. I was absolutely terrified waiting for that bullet to hit me or one of my friends in the back. As we ran further into the park and mustered up the courage to look back, we could no longer see the car and breathe a sigh of relief. We all just stood there trying to get our breath back. Luckily, we all knew the area pretty well, and we decided to continue along the old gravel road that we knew would take us back towards our homes. As we walked down the path, our conversation was pretty minimal, as we were too preoccupied of the thoughts of what had just happened and how lucky we were. However, that feeling of relief didn't last very long. As we got near the end of the gravel road, I could make out a car at the very end, and I started to wonder to myself, could that be the guy? We kept walking, but then just like out of a scary movie, the car flipped on its headlights and started revving its engine, and under the dim lights of the street, my heart began to sink as I then realized it was the brown station wagon. We knew he could see us. He was waiting for us. Taunting us. He must know these streets well and where each of the different roads would lead. Well, we didn't waste another second. We took off once again and jumped the fence of a neighboring house. We didn't stop, we just kept running and running and jumping all of the fences. I glanced toward the road many times and I would see his car screaming past. Each time we made it to a main road, we would see his car appear again and once again speed towards us, and we dove over fences and tried to find another way. This happened about two or three more times after that. Around 1.30 a.m., we got down the end of another side road, and we couldn't see at the time, but the fence we jumped was covered in barbed wire, and it tore our clothes as we slid down. I let out a few groans as it grazed my arm. We were now in some kind of paddock-type area, and we could faintly hear the screeches of his tires racing around trying to find us. We just stood there crouching in the dark, breathing heavily, standing in cow manner, but we didn't care. We probably crouched for about 15 minutes or so, just waiting in the dark. Figuring by now he must be gone, we made our way back onto the main road. We kept our eyes peeled and kept glancing over our shoulders, and as the headlights appeared in the distance on many occasions, we each stopped breathing for a second, wondering in anticipation whether or not it was going to be the brown station wagon. 
We didn't see him again after that, and around 3 a.m., we walked my friend John home. Dave came back to mind for a bit so we could talk more calmly about our experience. Dave went home later that night. What was only meant to be a 20-minute walk home turned into a two-hour terror trip that I will never forget. What was even more scary was a week or so later, I heard on the news that an elderly lady was shot by a random stranger one late night not too far from where this happened. Whether it was the same guy or not, I'll never know. All I really know is that my friends and I were incredibly lucky to escape that night. I live in a relatively safe area in Scotland, though I've had several really odd and scary experiences since I moved here about four years ago. I'm a short 29-year-old woman and I work in a pub, so I often get out of work quite late. I never wear my headphones when headed home at night, so this particular night was no different than usual. Alarm set, doors locked and checked, then said goodbye to my colleague and then went our separate ways to get home. I usually cross a grocery store car park to get home, and that night something struck me as odd. There were a couple of cars parked there, which is normal, but something just felt off this time. I looked over my shoulder and I clocked a guy in a hat walking a distance behind me. This wasn't weird, but I decided to keep an eye on him nonetheless. I exited the car park to the main road that I lived off of, but still had a good mile or so to go before I finally reached my flat. I checked over my shoulder again, and sure enough, the guy was walking in the same direction as me. The distance between us was starting to close, so I decided to cross the road. Looking over my shoulder, I was able to not only look for traffic coming, but I was also able to keep an eye on him. I crossed the road and didn't bother to look back for another few minutes, assuming he had stayed on the other side. But I began to hear footsteps approaching. I glanced over my shoulder and saw this guy was about 20 feet behind me. I had a soft drink in a glass bottle in my bag, and figuring I was overacting but better safe than sorry, I stuck my hand into my bag and gripped the bottle. Another 45 seconds and this guy was close enough to touch me, but he slows to my pace and then says, Hello there, how are you? I ignored him and I don't respond. I long ago gave up on pretenses of being polite if I feel uncomfortable. If I'm feeling uncomfortable, I really don't care about a stranger's feelings. But he persists in talking to me. Hi there, are you going to work today? No. I was being short with him. Are you going home? Yes, I said coldly. Do you live in this direction? I just looked at him, and he tried again. Do you live off this road? Where do you live? Do you live close by? I don't respond to him, and I slowed my pace, letting him walk on. I was still gripping the glass bottle, ready to hit him with it should he try anything. He tried to slow down so that I would catch up with him, but I slowed down so much that I was barely walking. He was maybe 300 yards away at this point and simply stopped and turned around, watching me and waiting for me to catch up with him. I reached into my pocket with my free hand and tried to get my phone. Of course, my phone was dead. I figured it would last the walk home, but the dodgy battery had other ideas. Surprisingly though, I wasn't really afraid. He had started walking again, but again, still quite slowly. He looked over his shoulder again after another minute, and I seized the opportunity. There was a path to a block of flats that was obscured by tall hedges, so I leaped behind them. I waited for nearly ten minutes, never letting go of that bottle the whole time. I peeked around the hedges to make sure he was there. I peeked behind bins and bus stops to make sure he wasn't hiding, but as far as I could tell, I had lost him. Maybe he didn't mean anything by this, but if you suspect a woman is afraid of you and she's walking alone at night, don't speak to her. It won't help. And especially, don't ask her where she lives repeatedly. I wasn't drunk. I didn't appear to be drunk or need any help. I was just walking home like I usually would. I am, however, inclined to believe that he had bad intentions. I would rather be too cautious than not. So did that creepy dude who seemed to be following me home that night. Screw off. I'm a 28-year-old male, and seven nights ago at around 10.30pm, my life changed. I was walking home from work in downtown Vancouver, British Columbia 
when I was randomly punched and kicked by someone walking past me. Now, I had never seen this person before. I said nothing to this person, and I wasn't in their way. In fact, I made a point of moving out of his way as he was walking fairly close to me. As I walked past him, he swung his hand out, punched me in the forehead, and went in for a punch. Being a fairly big guy with defensive training, I was able to protect myself from the second punch. After working a very long and hard shift, I didn't want to get into a fight, so I tried to flee. That's when I saw some people walking in my way and watching what was going on. I screamed for them to call the police, and that's when he started to kick me in the back. The couple didn't call, so I reached for my phone and pushed the power button about five times to activate SOS mode. The operator picked up, and when the assailant heard I was on the phone, he bounced. The police came, took my statements, and in the process, another unit arrested the guy. I've had a pretty bad headache, and I'm all bruised up. But the worst part is the mental anguish that I suffer walking in public, and even more so when I have to walk alone at night. The walk is down a very populated main road, but that doesn't ease the pain and stress. I always make sure to watch every single person now, check over my shoulders every couple of seconds, and practically jog all the way home. I feel like an idiot for even feeling this way. As a male raised in a household of competitive fighters, I was always told to never feel weak, but all I wanted to do when I got home that night was just sit in the shower and break down. Anyways, that's my story. Thank you for taking the time to listen to it and letting me vent. And for anyone else that walks home at night, please be careful. My name is Matthew, and this is the most horrifying experience I've ever had. This was something straight out of a horror movie. I lived in a rural town in California and worked at a local Domino's. I have to walk past some woods in order to get to my house. I've been working at Domino's since I was 17, and I am now 19. I have also been walking past the woods, and nothing strange has ever happened to me. Until today. So, my shift at Domino's ended at 7.30, a bit later than my normal time I get out. So I'm walking, and I could see the woods maybe a few miles up ahead. Finally, I get to the woods, and I'm on the side of the road. To get a better idea of where I was, imagine a road and trees on both sides. Now, there are barely any cars or people on the road at this time. Keep in mind that it's getting dark and you only have very little light, so it really added to the creepiness. Anyway, as I was walking, I thought I could hear something coming from the trees. I looked, but I didn't see anything. I continued walking when a rock was thrown at me and landed right in front of me. I then turned around and looked to the trees and I could see someone waving at me. It was dark so I couldn't see who it was or how they looked. I asked, uh, hey, do you need something? He responded in a loud whisper and said, hey, come over here, I want to show you something. I told him that I had to get home and that I couldn't be late. He responded saying, Oh, d don't worry, it will only take a second, I really need your help with something. I told him I'll help, but I only had a minute. He said a minute is all it will take. I took a deep breath and walked over to him. He said that he found a man-made hole dug in the ground and wanted to see what was down there and that he didn't have a light. I told him I would shine my light with my iPhone down there to take a look. Doing that was the biggest mistake I've ever done. I walked over and stood by the hole with the man behind me. Before I was about to shine the light, the man pushed me down the hole. I fell about 20 feet and landed on something soft. I started cussing and screaming at the man, but I didn't see him. I stood up and I could feel the soft thing I was on. I had to see what I was standing on. I shined the flashlight on my phone and shined it down. I felt like my whole world had been shattered. The light revealed the body. It was a naked woman who looked to be about 20 and she had been killed. 
She had cuts everywhere on her body. I stayed down there for a good half hour before finally managing to climb out and run home. I didn't tell my parents about what I saw. I only told a few of my closest friends. My name is Courtney and I was 23 years old when this happened. I worked at a McDonald's right near my house. In order to get to my house or to my work, you have to pass by a public park. I always carry pepper spray on me in case anything happens to me. I've been working at McDonald's for a few months now and whenever I would work, I would always pass by the park and nothing has ever happened until this one night. It was a Wednesday I believe and I had just gotten off from work. It was around 11 p.m. and I was starting to walk home. The reason why I walked from work to home is because my house is close by so there's no need to drive. Anyway, while I was walking, I looked behind me for whatever reason and I saw a man in all black following me. I thought nothing of it and just simply kept walking. I looked behind me once more and this time I could tell that he was walking a bit faster. I walked faster too, hoping that this guy would go away. I felt like he could put his hand on me at any moment so I had my hand on my pepper spray just in case. And then it happened. I felt a hand cover my mouth and another hand grab my neck. I screamed and took out my pepper spray and sprayed the man of the eyes and he fell to the ground. I ran home while the man lied on the ground screaming in pain. I finally came home and went inside almost out of breath, but unfortunately, it didn't end there. My parents weren't home and when I went to look out of my bedroom window, I saw the man across the street looking right at me. He then ran off into the darkness and I never saw him again. <laughs>